Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 74. Storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. Robert McKee. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humbled and quarantined host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters, all you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Sign up for it there and you will get three amazing videos, almost an hour in length total in your inbox. So just head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Before we get started, guys, I set up a special link to help people affected by the coronavirus, and you can donate to Feed America. There is a lot of people in need out there, and Feed America is a great organization, and they're helping millions of people on a daily basis, and they also need your help. If you want to donate even five bucks, 10 bucks, it goes a long way. Head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash help. Now, guys, in today's episode, we're going to tackle what is going on in Hollywood for screenwriters during the COVID problem, issue, pandemic that we're dealing with. Now, Hollywood is, like we talk about in this episode, there's two camps. They're either, uh, either you have your head in the sand like an ostrich and saying, everything is going to be fine. We're going to shoot in August. Everything is going to be perfect. And there's the other camp where is the chicken little, little camp where the sky is falling. We're not going to shoot and we're not going to go into full production probably for at least a year, if not longer, into 2021 and possibly the beginning of 2022. I'm leaning more towards the chicken little. That's my own personal opinion. But I hear things on the street. I've talked to my contacts in the industry and I wanted to bring somebody else on who has a different set of contacts and a different set of perspective on how a screenwriter can survive and thrive in COVID, during this COVID process, and after COVID, how to best position themselves after COVID. And today's guest will help us with that. His name is Jason Merch, and he's over at Stage 32 and does really great work with screenwriters there uh, day in and day out. And I, I me, and, me and Jason just go into it. We really kind of break down what is going on how the industry is reacting, what the studios are doing, what the agencies are doing, what they're looking for, how to, you know, write what to write, what not to write right now. For God's sakes, please don't write a COVID feature. Nobody wants to watch a COVID feature. Stop writing it, but we'll get into that. But this turned into an epic conversation, and I can't wait for you guys to listen. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jason Merch. I'd like to welcome to the show Jason Merch. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. How you doing, man? I'm I am good, sir. I am good. You are uh you are um you work with my brother from another mother, uh, RB Bato, over at stage thirty two. So uh, I, you know, I talked to RB. I was like, "Hey, you should come on the show of the screen because he hasn't been on my shows enough." Um, but we, <laughs> yeah. What, what did you just say the record was? Or for, for, he's for- got. I think we sat down and counted it out eleven times between workshops that I record and him actually being a guest. 
about 11 times total in the the history of indie film hustle. And now he's been on Film Entrepreneur, which is my other podcast, but he's never been on this podcast specifically. Right. I, I'm thinking – I've never recorded him for this podcast. So he said, first you should come on and then he'll come on eventually to talk about uh, things as well. So that's high. That's high. You know, there's a lot of pressure on you, sir. I appreciate that. No, he's <laughs> again, he's, he's, he's a fantastic guy. And of course he would throw me out first. So I appreciate <laughs> it. That's the kind of guy he is. You know? and, and we were talking, we were talking off air a little bit. I'm like, how is RB hanging in there? Because I mean, he's always traveling. Uh, he's always running, you know, doing something. He's like, Oh, I'm over in can. Oh, I'm over in, Berlin, I'm over here or there. And I always, and his Instagram is, it's, is, is honestly for me, it's the most infuriating Instagram feed ever because, because <laughs> he's always <laughs> having so much more fun than I am until yeah. I, fi- and then the last episode he was on, I'm like, we have to start something called hashtag this fucking guy, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> which has taken off. Surprisingly enough, people have been tagging him. Amazing. Hashtag I love this it. fucking guy. And he he just pisses himself. <laughs> well, he's he's the guy. He's the kind of guy that can be at like three different events somehow at once, and you have no idea there's three of how him. he's doing. Like he's all over the place. All the there's time. three. Yeah. There's three of him, and each of them has uh, two livers. There's no right. question. At least two or three livers each. Um, right. <laughs> well, when his, when, it, when his handle is RB walks into a bar, I you mean, know <laughs> that dude party. He's yeah. on. He's on on brand, sir. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, 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 your brand, man. No question. So, um, so you've been in the business for a long time. How did you get into the yep. business? I, I, so I went to school for writing and directing because at Chapman University down in Orange County. Um, because like every young film school student, I wanted to be Steven Spielberg or sure. Martin Scorsese or you know, and you know, you you go through school and you you learn how to write screenplays and you quickly realize that you're not those guys. You know, you are, there is one Steven Spielberg and you're not it, dude. So, you know, you get out of school and I think initially, like a lot of film school students, you come out and you think, all right, well, where's my overall deal? You know, like where, I, I just walk onto the lot and they're just going to give me shit. Right? I, I, and, that's the way it works. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, obviously. So, right. And so one of the things I quickly realized is film school teaches you how to make a film. They'll teach you three point lighting and how to cut on an avid and all these things, but they don't tell you how to get a film made. And my first job out of the industry or out of, out of college in the industry was at entertainment tonight, the new show, entertainment sure. new show. And you know, I'm a 22, 23 year old kid at that point, And I'm, you know, helping an, an executive producer write the show. And it's fun because you're, you know, I'm at the Emmys and the Oscars and I'm sure. standing next to Brad Pitt at the Golden Globes and it's fun. And then you quickly realize that, you know, I'm like a, I'm like a high school kid at prom, but I'm at, I'm with the yearbook, you know, it's like, yeah, you're at prom, but you're not at prom. You're taking photos of the kids that are actually at prom. And so I was like, all right, no, fuck this. Awesome this is not, analogy. this is not what I want to be doing. This is not what I got into school, you know? And so I went and found, I went and worked at a uh, management company that's no longer around anymore. They've since merged, um, but it was evolution management and evolution's big claim to fame um, founded by uh, Mark Berg and Oren Kulis was the saw franchise. And so I came in right at the end of right as after Saw took off and became a phenomenon. I came in right around the time Saw Two was in production, and so I was on the lit side of their management company, working for two managers. And so I've read every really good and really bad horror script under the sun, right? Where it's like, you know, you you where you write somebody back and you're like, look, bro, we're not going to make this, but you got to talk to somebody because you got issues with your parents, man. Like we can't make. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you should seek help. But you should seek help. Right. Yeah, seek help. Talk to a professional. <laughs> and stop sending this around town. Um, but you know, so I did that. I, I was I was on the lit side, but and that was really truly the first exposure to the business. You know, where you learn buying and selling and and how projects get made and what you know what attachments you need to have. I when I came in, um, and this is two thousand five, two thousand six. Um, when I came in, uh, you know, you could still sell a feature pitch in the room like oh, yeah. that. Like the player back in the day, like yeah. the player. Yeah, you could walk – I mean you could walk in and sell a movie poster and then that you – know, they'd be like, yeah, we'll write it later. You know, and people are just like, all right, they just write the check. Um, but then it became, okay, no, we need a, a a treatment or a script, you know, script mint, you know, which is like a half treatment, half script 
hybrid. And then it was like, okay, we need this and we need a filmmaker or we need this and a filmmaker and who's your piece of talent that's attached. And so I watched this evolution of the business where studios started to get more and more, you can call it conservative, you can call it risk averse, you can, you know, more demanding, whatever it is. And so I watched that, that aspect of the business change. And then from there, I went and worked at a company called Storyline Entertainment, um, founded by the late, uh, great Craig Zayden and Neil Marin, who produced Chicago. And we were doing hairspray in the bucket list when I came on. Um, and that was very much in the sort of studio development model, you know, where your, your, you know, new line gives you a chunk of change and says, okay, go put these stars in this movie. Um, and I ran their development, their feature and television development, um, you know, for, for a couple of years and then moved into film finance and production and worked for a company called Image Nation Abu Dhabi, which was based in the Middle East. And so I spent five years in the Middle East um, learning film finance, independent film finance production. We had international deals with companies based in the U.S., participant media and Warner Brothers and uh, Parks McDonald, Hyde Park Entertainment, the company through which I was hired. Um, and that was a really eye-opening experience because you're, I was learning, you know, yeah, a studio will give you $30 million, but when you've got to go raise money, what does that actually look like? And that was during the, you know, just as foreign pre-sales started to kind of taper off in terms of really being able to finance your project. Um, and then, then, you know, again, after that, it was, it was independently producing. I started to put together an animated, uh, film that I was asked to come on and produce. Um, and then, you know, uh, all throughout that, I, I knew, you know, RB, Rich Botto and, and Amanda Tony over at Stage 32 because I taught for them. And um, ultimately, you know, about a year and a half ago, a little over a year and a half ago, they said, hey, would you want to come on full time and and work with us to build out this this division, you know, working with writers? And I said, absolutely. That's the kind of that's right in my wheelhouse. So that's kind of a, a broad strokes, you know, that, of what I've been yeah, absolutely. And in, in the world that we live in today, uh, that's, that's a probably good place to be right now because you, you have work all the time. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's all online and I can do it from the comfort of my sweatpants if I need to. The abso- absolutely. And the, in the bungalow, uh, that you have built out right. in your house. <laughs> Exactly. My old Hollywood bungalow. Right. Which I don't think they look like this anymore, by the way. You know? They don't. So. I've, yeah, I was on a bungalow the other day at, in the back lot of Universal. And I mean, the bungalows themselves, they do. But inside, it's not, not the right. same anymore. Yeah, exactly but it, right. But if you watch Hail Caesar, this is what a bungalow looks like. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so there is obviously an elephant in the room that's called COVID. Um, right. I, I wanted I to have. You haven't heard about it? You haven't heard about it? What is this? I don't know what this is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously COVID is, is, is affected, um, our industry. It was affected the world, but let's focus on our industry. It has affected our industry in ways that, um, I don't think anyone ever saw, anyone even conceived. Um, if I would have told you in January that we were shutting down all movie theaters around the world. And by the way, there's not going to be a blockbuster summer. Um, all of those movies are going to be pushed into the into the winter, and God knows what the hell's going to happen <laughs> in the fall and the sure. winter. I, I, there's only so many slots, and there's you know, right. I, so there's that question. And the oh, by the way, the Oscars are going to be postponed for two months, um, right? And there's no war specifically going on. <laughs> Um, right. you know, it's not a world war that stopped us all. Right. No, you would have said you're absolutely write that down. Cause it might make a good story. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, absolutely. it's insane. And, so and, and, yeah. Yeah. You know, so tell me, so what are you, I mean, you're, you're pretty, your, your ear is pretty close to the grindstone when it comes to, um, what's going on in town. How are you seeing the town react? What, what are their plans? Cause, I, there's a lot of new. There's a lot of people in the news and a lot of things, you know, articles and 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 reports of like, okay, so everyone's going back to back to work, and we're going to start shooting in July, and um, you know, we're going to start shooting in August for the new television season, or we're going to do everything at home. It's going to be all quarantine right. shows. And what what are you hearing? I mean, yeah, it's it's a lot of that, and I think you know, again, before we jumped on here, you you and I were talking about this. There's there's multiple groups of people, you know, people that do say, okay, we're 100% coming back in July and we're in prep. And it's, it's, you know, it's just a matter of getting face masks and we're on board. And then there's people that are saying like, look, we're not coming back till next year, realistically, you know? And I think that there's, 
there's a desire to come back. <laughs> I think that practically and functionally, nobody knows what that means, right? So I was just, I just saw that that you know NBC, uh, you know, greenlit three pilots or wants to put three, uh, I'm sorry, five pilots in a production. There's a daytime soap that wants to come back and start shooting in July. Of course, we all heard that Jurassic Park is going to be shooting in the UK. Um, and by the way, they've had to add $5 million to their budget uh, in order to be able to do that, which I think is interesting because if you're looking at sort of a scalable way, you're going to bring things back. You know, they're talking about, yeah, it's not just face masks and, and te- oh, no. d- routine testing and and medical staff on hand and all these things, right? You know, that's that's going to be, at least for a while, something that filmmakers have to consider, right? So, if you know, if you're doing a $100-plus plus million movie and you've got a $5 million budget for that, what does it look like for an independent filmmaker who, you know, has to have some level of those things accounted for, you know? Yeah, if you're, um, doing, if you're doing a half a million dollar, a million dollar movie – uh, you might have, you might need fifty extra grand, hundred right, extra. Yeah, ec- you might need a little extra cash, to- and you're going to need to find that that medical person. Like, what does that look like to have? And it, there, there, there's not like a, a a place you can go and get them all because they're not right. there. There is no that. This is a brand new position that I think will be on for the foreseeable future. Right. Absolutely. Huh. For, absolutely. And so, you know, I think that again, there's a desire to come back. There's a desire to to return to normalcy. Um, I think that. Practically speaking, nobody knows what it looks like. I think nobody knows <laughs> right. what it actually physically looks like to be in production every day and, and you know, having a Q-tip stuck up your nose before you go to work, right? Um, or, or what it looks like. For, I was just talking to, to a writer today and, you know, I said, imagine being – a piece of like a piece of talent who's older, you know, you're talking about a guy who or guy or girl who's in their 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Those are the most vulnerable, I think, because, you know, you know, we can talk about sort of, you know, the the survival rate of COVID and the fact that it's a 98.5% survival rate, depending on how old you are, but you start to getting in the, the older generations that yeah. are filmmakers there. I mean, they're, I mean, some of these people might be forced into retirement because of this, because they're not going to be allowed to work on, I mean, trying to ensure uh, a production. Like how you do know? you ensure, how do you ensure Marty, uh, Mr. Scorsese yeah, uh, right. on his next $200 million Netflix film with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio that they just signed? How do you ensure that? And like, right. and, and, and that's never been an insurance line item on, on production insurance on like, right. oh, what happens if someone, gets covid and right. for whatever reason they they don't they don't make it. it yeah absolutely and it was because specifically because of the production so how do you protect against that insurance companies right. aren't jumping on board right now no. right so i mean then they have to sign waivers and it's like this whole thing and now a sag's not allowing that uh right. yeah, that scott bayo um mm-hmm. production which i had no idea scott bayo still was in production <laughs> but um that scott bayo um sorry i i have yeah. no love loss for mr bayo uh <laughs> though i did like charles and charts um <laughs> back in the day um and chachi but um but yeah his whole thing got canceled because sag's like no 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 you you can't have that do that so that whole thing and then having right. all the unions Agree, because you know there's a historical precedence for all the unions agreeing right. on yeah, how production it. should be handled. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, and that's it. And you know, it's interesting because you're you're exactly right. And you know, ultimately, yeah, you know, it's going to be the, the the rules themselves that that they put out. You know, the document came out, and and everybody's looking at. It. I mean, it's just not, in my opinion, sustainable long term because nothing can get done. I mean, it just either becomes cost prohibitive for especially these smaller productions. Um, or it just becomes so overbearing that people are like, I, I can't do this for what you're asking, you know, and that's that's going to be the real change. But I so I, I've also mentioned this on, on a couple of the other uh, my other shows is that is there a model moving forward for these for a standard studio project, which is, you know, a Marvel two hundred million dollar plus movie because that's standard. All the studios, as far as feature films are concerned, that is standard one hundred fifty to two hundred fifty million dollars because they don't they don't go for singles. They stopped going right. for singles a long time ago. It's home run or strikeout. Right. It's all the time. Is there a model financially that makes sense without a theatrical component? Not only here in the U.S. but worldwide because the worldwide audience or the worldwide box office 
is 70% or something like that of, mm-hmm. of, of total revenue generated. So when this happened, China shut down. They were a large market. Europe shut down. And they're still shut down in a lot of these areas. So is there moving forward, does this financial model work anymore? Will we continue to have $250 million spectacles if we can't go theatrically? Is is SVOD going to be able to pick up the weight? I, I, I don't know. Right. Trolls was cool. It's $100 million. That's nice. And it was a unique film, a unique set of times. But Throw a Marvel, throw Avengers up there and let me know how that works out. Throw right. Wonder, Wonder Woman or Bond or any right. of the movies that are sitting Absolutely. on the shelf right now. Well, and, that, and that's exactly right. It was interesting to see which, you know, which film studios punted to later in the year, right? Um, Top Gun Maverick, for instance, or Bond, right? Both got punted. Wonder Woman, yeah. Uh, or, or Trolls where they're like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just see what happens. Um, <laughs> or look at, look at um, you know, something like um, uh, Hamilton. Which was meant to be released throughout theater theatrically because I mean that ticket's still a thousand dollars a ticket in New York at least it was at the time, um, and then they're like, all right, well let's put it in theaters and and get you know a couple hundred million dollars out of the rest of the world, and now it's well let's put it on Disney Plus and just see if we can pull in some of those those people who had watch it on on streaming. subscribers subscribers yeah. they're still they're still trying to get subscribers yeah. i'm very excited about hamilton because i've never seen it i've been i've, I've listened to Me that too. album probably That's about a, five a thousand times i've listened to that i could re, re, i could say it yeah. verbatim um so i just saw the trailer came out the other day i was just like oh this is amazing yeah. but look at that world they spent 75 million on that right if it's like 75 right. million for that for that purchase yeah. for that for that for those rights which is massive <laughs> It's a massive purchase for a yeah. for for a movie. I, yeah. I mean, is is that a record? Like a, for a purchase I mean, of a film for something like that? It's it's pre- I mean, it's got to be up there. I mean, I, I can't imagine. Um, and that's and that's what's so interesting is to your point. I think there will ultimately be a singles and doubles model that comes back because of SVOD, VOD, streaming, what those platforms. Because you know, uh, to your point about international sales. I mean, international sales used to, to finance and fund so much of what I did on the, on the independent feature side, Mm -hmm. which was, we've got a $14 million movie that needs to look like 35. It's got one big car chase. It's got two, you know, B plus a minus pieces of talent. We can do that movie for $14 million. We can pre-sale 60 to 70% of it and only put about a million dollars of real money into it. Now and and again and it, and it will look good. Will it look theatrically? You know, theatrically released good? No, it'll. It, you know, we would put those into ten cities. You know, and basically try to roll into a um, a, a streaming SVOD release. That's what I think it's going to look like. You, you're going to have this this gap that you can fill with a twenty million dollar movie maybe as long as there is some sort of output for it that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, twenty million dollar movie those days they'll Disney Plus will be popping those out like candy all day. Absolutely. All day because they I mean even the Disney Channel movies that they did, which are not twenty million, but they were like, you know, four or five million right. all all day they'll be popping those out. And that's Absolutely. what Netflix does. That's the right. what what used to be the movie of the week um and it's now become the right. Netflix um or Hallmark or right. Hallmark, Lifetime. Well, and that's and that's the thing. I mean, you look at. I mean, if I would have told you again, let's go back to that scenario where it's all pre-COVID. If I was going to tell you that a, like David Spade would have the number one film in America and it wouldn't be seen in a single theater, you'd be like, "What the hell are you talking about?" But that's what it is, you know. Was that did that I, the Netflix film? Did that do that? That was well? a Netflix film. That was a Netflix film. Uh, called the wrong. It was like the wrong Missy or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw. It. I didn't yeah. see. It. I didn't see the movie, but I saw. I passed through my my yeah. feed. So that had, according to Netflix, was the most downloaded film. Right. I don't know if I can't remember if it was in their history or certainly their recent history. No, again, it won't be hit. No, Tiger King, obviously. It, no. It, oh, <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's get serious. Right. No, no, but exactly. probably like right. weekly, probably or like the week right. or the month or something. So, but you remember Tiger King was a series, but this was a single feature film. Yeah. So the single feature film gets an incredible amount of downloads. It's a, it's a, it's right in Adam Sandler's wheelhouse in terms of what they do. And it crushed, it crushed. And it, and it was not one, it was not a major blockbuster. You know, it wasn't an Avengers thing. 
So the, it's funny because I've actually done some research on what happens, wh- why Adam Sandler is having success on, mm-hmm. on, on, because he hadn't had success. Like Sony lost him. He was Sony's boy for a long time. And, you right. know, he kept putting out, you know, bomb after bomb and it mm-hmm. just didn't do as well. But in Netflix, he kills. And the reason for my, for my research that he kills is that when people are scanning through, when you know, when you click on an Adam Sandler film, generally speaking, un- other, other, other than uncut gems, mm-hmm. generally speaking, you know what you're going to get. And there's a comfort there with all the, with him, um, with Deuce Bigelow, um, what's his name? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know who I'm talking yeah. about? Uh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. uh, that actor and, and David Spade, Chris Rock, that whole crew Adam Sandler has. You understand what Kevin James, you, you get that, you know what you're going to get. You know what and, you're going to get. And right. they'll give, and it's part of their subscription, and they'll, They'll just download it. And I've watched a ton of Adam Sandler movies. I was, sure. I was a fan of Adam Sandler from a back Absolutely. in the day. And he, you know, he's still doing the same shit he, stick, stick he did right. in Waterboy. Like it's absolutely, it's all, it's all, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's you not know. really changed dramatically until he does like Uncut Gems, which is a whole other like punch right. drunk love. Punch drunk love. Know. He goes that dramatic. He goes, side. he wants to be yeah. serious sometimes and that's right. fine. And he should, he's actually a fantastic actor. He's a, he's a great actor. He's a fantastic you know? and, and I think, and I think the biggest disservice that, that the industry or, you know, th- that's done to him is that they don't treat him as though he's an, a, a fantastic actor. You know, they're right. like, ah, get back in the box. You know? Yeah. Well, exactly. they did the same thing with Robin Williams and the same thing with Jim Carrey. Exactly. Any comedian, they, they go down that road. But it's fascinating the way the whole industry has changed where before you needed to have a huge giant blockbuster. Um, you know, box office receipts, but now you don't because the model is no. di- like Netflix's model is completely different than right. than anybody else's. But they changed the game, and we could have a whole series oh, of absolutely. conversation about Netflix and how they changed Hollywood. But yeah. it, it's fascinating. Um, but with, with back going back to COVID, though, what are you hearing as far as the studios? Because I know from what I'm hearing. They're still listening to pitches. They're yep. still Absolutely. buying content. They're still buying scripts. They're still looking for stuff. Absolutely. Um, that has actually, it's actually increased. It's increased. It's increased. Absolutely. And on, and on my side, through stage 32, you know, um, obviously, like I said, we do, you know, consultations, coverage, pitch sessions, all that stuff. Um, and we have writers from all over the world who are meeting virtually now with executives through that platform. And platform uh, the, the executives are incredibly hungry for content. I think you know since the beginning of the year, it has, it has only gotten more busy where we've had, I think, 275 requests from executives looking to meet with writers. And you know in terms of development, nothing slowed down. In terms of hearing pitches, nothing has slowed down. Like you said, it's ramped up. Um, What's changed, I think, is what they're interested in. You know, I don't think you're going out right now and pitching your (laughs) post-apocalyptic virus movie. You know, (laughs) that's that might be enough. Uh, Um, Yeah. Look, look, I just heard somebody they're releasing the full. I think the full moon guys are releasing um, uh, coronavirus zombies. Like, I mean, you know, it's. There's an audience for it, I guess. We're living it. We're living it right now. I can turn on the news and watch that for free, you know? So that's – so what – I mean everything I'm hearing from executives, I got a really good buddy at an an A-list production company and he said every studio he talks to says, give me a rom-com. Where's your rom-com? And he's like – I haven't developed a rom com in five, five, ten years. What the hell are you – you know? But that's – you know, they want romantic comedy. They want light, fair Right. They want things that are inspirational or aspirational. They Family. want things that live in that um, uh, sort of uh, best exotic marigold, the bucket list, good feel good type movies, even if they, even if there's something that is, um, you know, daunting as a part of it. Right. Bucket list, for instance, is about two guys who have terminal cancer traveling the world. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know that, but it's an uplifting film and it's a lot of fun. And that's that's what they want. We want escapist entertainment. Um, I think there's all you know. There's always still a place for really good thrillers, um, psychological, uh, paranormal, paranormal stuff always as well. Um, animation is going to be coming in a big way, and that's not to say that it's it's you know not kids movies, not kids animation, but it's is there a place for adult animation, you know, grown up stuff, uh, Scanner Darkly or or whatever it is, where you might be able to take something that that you've you've written that could be animation or it could be shot let's see if it works for animation because your actors are in a booth that's controllable 
Your animators can work remotely, largely. So it still keeps up the social distancing thing. Um, so a lot of, I know, I've known three managers who are like, give me animation writers, give me animation directors. Um, let me, I want to give me scripts that, that are animated or that can be animated because that's what studios are looking for as well. And that, I think that's, you know, obviously that's a byproduct of COVID directly, you know? And, and, um, and obviously dog safe Christmas movies, obviously. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean obviously. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's, you know what's so funny is there, I, there are still so many directors that say, like, look, I can I can bring this movie to, to Hallmark right now and we can do it for under a million bucks. And it's a Christmas rom-com and it will crush because you go to any home in the middle of America, you walk into any house randomly and they will have Hallmark on watching those movies during holiday time. You know, yeah, and, and they and they like they have them like on twenty four seven. They have so much of those now. That's twenty four seven loop, and thirty days or sixty days before Christmas are running up, and and it's and it's it's evergreen and it's evergreen right. and the Christmas those Christmas movies. And if you put the right, if you put Dean Cain, uh, you put yeah. uh, Melissa Joan Hart, uh, you put the certain talent that has made a very lucrative career. Absolutely. In and, that, there's a, and there's a whole in formula space. to it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. here's the setup. Here's the new person in town. Here's the struggle. <laughs> and here's the kiss at the end. And we're out, you know, and done cut to, cut to your Charmin commercial or whatever. And that's <laughs> it. <you know? laughs> exactly. But that's the world. Um, so as far as screenwriters are concerned, I mean, obviously there's a lot of content. And of course, we haven't talked about series as much. We're talking about films. Right. Series are huge. And, and, huge. and, and that is actually, I think the, me personally, I think that's kind of like the growth area. I think a lot of people have said that this is the growth area for writing and production because it's you you get more bang for your buck, um, you know, mm-hmm. your financial buck. Like if you got twenty million bucks, and you make one movie or a season, right? You know, right. It, it's Absolutely. and that's what people are looking for right now. Like Netflix is looking for series, docu series, and and right. you know just series in general. And now there's so like Peacock and HBO Max. And, oh yeah, they're they're every everyone's gonna every, they're all gonna have now the thing. I mean, there's two two big things there. I mean, the first one is, you know, as, yes, as a screenwriter, you should absolutely be writing and developing a series or a pilot or something. And I, I just had a, I was just talking to another writer that I was mentoring earlier, and I said, you know, they had they had one screenplay, and they're like, how do I get a manager? And I said, write five more things <laughs> and write a pilot, right, and then you can really start to look for a manager. Um, but one of the things I talked about was this idea that even if you write a series and you're going into a Netflix or a, a Peacock or a, a Hulu or whatever it is, the first question they're going to say is, oh, this is great. Who's your showrunner? Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, the first thing you need to do as a screenwriter is understand you're not going to be running this show and you don't want to because running a show is a nightmare. <laughs> And and as a first time screenwriter, I think a lot, I think the biggest misconception, the best, biggest mistake writers make is thinking, okay, I'm going to run in, I know my story, I'm going to run this show, and that's not what this is. You it's know, not you the way be this in the, is. Be in the room, yeah, be in the room, but no, you don't want to be running the show. So yes, series series are always going to be um, uh, one of the first things that I tell writers to write, um, or at least a pilot. Um, and have an idea where that's going, but then immediately try and find somebody who is like-minded, who understands your world, that's capable and has done this before, and then you can walk that into a Netflix. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of film, a lot of filmmakers and screeners think they could just kind of like walk in the idea. Oh, Netflix is buying like right. crazy. They're like, I, I heard right. like I think probably within a month after COVID hit, I heard from inside of Netflix that they're like, look, um, we're good. Yeah. We we've got three years of content either done or in post. Right. So if we stopped production today, we have three years of content. Three so, years. And <laughs> yeah. and by the way, all the studios freaked out and just dumped a ton of titles of them at a quarter, a, a twenty five cents on the dollar. Yeah. So right. I started seeing that. I started seeing like on Netflix. I'm like, wow, these are. All these studio movies, Brad Pitt and all yeah. these, I started yeah. flying by on Netflix. Like, what, what happened here? Right. So, so it, there's a little yeah. misnomer. Do you agree? Do you hear the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. I, that, that's exactly right. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that, that people, yeah, people think that Netflix is out there buying like, you know, a, a, a drunk sailor. <laughs> right. And they're just not, you know, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not, you don't walk in. Again, in the same way that I thought as a kid, I could walk into Paramount and get my overall deal. You don't walk into a script and be like, all right, Netflix, here it is. You know, where's my money? 
um, you've got you've got to come with something that's really groundbreaking and really interesting, and again fits what their model is, what their algorithms are. I mean, the thing that Netflix has that's so cool that that really didn't exist until their creation was an algorithm that tells them exactly what their customers want, right? I mean, we were developing, you know, in, even Hollywood, you're developing stuff basically on spec, even as a studio, hoping that somebody's going right. to show up. And, and there's still, tracking models. And they still, and yeah, they still kind of are, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's where this whole that's where the whole development model came from. Where let's buy 150 things at the you know over the course of the year. We'll we'll develop 20 of those. We'll put 10 into production. We'll release these you know and hope to God one hits right. Um, and then of course corporations came in and said, "Well, that's stupid," and they tried to pair those things back. And they, that's why we get Marvel movies and things like that because they're the only thing that works. Um, or that's the only thing that a person realizes I'm not going to be fired for buying or developing. You know, and that's another thing we we definitely should talk about fear. This entire town is run on fear and risk averse. That's totally because if you make one mistake, you're out. There is no there's no second strike. And and nobody, nobody that I know of, honestly, has ever been fired for saying no. They've been fired for saying yes. Right. But they've never been fired for saying no. So the default position really is cover your ass in a lot of these places. Now, that's not to say, and that's not to say that when a screenwriter brings in a pitch uh, or a script or a spec or whatever it is, there's not an executive that's like, fuck, I hope this is good. Like, they want it to be really good. Yeah, of you course. Know, because, so, because they want, they want to advance their career. So they're really hoping you bring it. So don't, you know, it's not to say that executives are sort of sitting back and being like, no, as a, as a default position, they want you to be bringing it, but they're going to be very selective on what they bring, you know, to, to the rest and, of their team. And to get behind know. and put their neck out on the line. And to get behind and say, and say, yeah, say, this is one that I would make. Yeah. Like back in the day, the, we, there would be executives or producers who would, who would take risks. You know, there's certain, I mean, yeah. Spielberg would take, Spielberg's made a lot of, he's produced a lot of content and not all yeah. of it's good. I mean, he's taken a lot yeah. of risks. On a lot of filmmakers, um, I think it was. I think he produced Zemeckis' first film, um, Car mm-hmm. uh, Car Wash. I think it's Car Wash. Yeah, and it bombed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, but right. Spielberg loved Zemeckis. He's like, I want you to do right. this Back to the Future thing. He's like, No, no, I don't want to. I can't. And he had to go off and do Romancing the Stone. Then he right. came back and did Back to the Future. Then, then he came back and did. But that. but Absolutely. it was but you but you know would have that would Zemeckis make it in today's world? You know, in this risk of, would any of these, like, with Scorsese? Like, can you imagine a 19 year old Scorsese today? Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I think you nailed it though. The, it's the relationship thing. You know, it's, it's the power of those relationships. Right. And, you know, again, RB will be on here preaching about it because it's so true. You know, the reason why you'll see a lot of these guys being successful and coming up together. Is that they built those relationships and and yeah, Zemeckis made something that that didn't hit, but Spielberg saw something in him. They maintain that connection and they and they are able to make something else, you know. Um, and that's true, you know. I tell screenwriters all the time: meet as many screenwriters as you can, meet as many directors as you can. Don't sit there and be like, I've got to know the head of the studio, you know. I've got to know the head of of this co- production company. You know, the guys that and the guys and girls who who help you get stuff made are your contemporaries and they're the people around you who um, you're coming up with. So meet them, talk to them, get their insights, get their feedback. You know, that's those are the people that that you need to impress and then and 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 help. And then they'll they'll be the ones that help pull you up as well. And that's how, um, you know, when I when I met RB five, four and a half, five years ago. Um, you know, we started to build a relationship just purely because we, mm-hmm. we liked each other. And then I eventually cast him in my feature. Um, and then made him world famous, obviously. But, uh. <laughs> right. <laughs> so magnanimous. Yeah. It's, I mean, obviously made him world famous. Um, and <laughs> he was telling me that he, he gets people that reach out to him all the time. Like, man, I saw you in the movie. You were, and it was, oh, uh, yeah, did, I, you, did Amanda ever tell you the story of how their first screening of the film? When they no, when RB no, and, and Amanda both came to my office, my my suite to to mm-hmm. watch the movie, and they sat there, I hadn't told them that I was going to have the character in the movie call. I called him RB. 
I originally was going to beep the name out very Kill Billish, but they kept saying it so right. many times. I'm like, it's going to sound, it just, I have to just kind of leave it in now. So right. every time the main character yells out RB, Amanda pisses herself. Even to this day, she cannot stop laughing. <laughs> RB is here. RB is here. <laughs> but that's to go so back funny. to what we were talking about, it is our relationship. That's a relationship. Sure. You know, that's, that's built over years. Um, and let's talk a little bit about relationships with screenwriters specifically. Yeah. Because it's something that, I mean, I've talked about before on other, on the other, on the other podcast, but in this one, I haven't really spoken about it too much. The, the do's and the don'ts about approaching someone in perceived mm. power or perceived, um, they could do something for your career. I know you know this very well. There is a stench. Of desperation is called Jahar Desperar. Uh, <laughs> that, <Yeah>. that oozes, <laughs> that oozes yeah. from, from desperate, yeah. um, filmmakers, screenwriters. And I know this because I bought cases of this cologne and wore it constantly when I walked around Hollywood when I first yeah. got here. And anyone who's been in town long can smell it a mile away. And I have people come up to me and like read my script. Um, connect me right. to this. Yep. Um, hey, I know you know RB. Can you get this to RB? Uh, can you do this? I'm like, I'm like, dude, sure. I don't know you. Like, yeah, but hi, my name is Alex. You know? Yeah, like, <laughs> hi, I'm Alex. Like, um, yeah. What, so, nice can you to, talk yeah, a little bit about doing? how to build a good, like, a, an authentic relationship, and and what your advice is on doing that with screenwriters? Because yeah. I think screenwriters and filmmakers both they both are uh, afflicted by the same disease um, in regards yes. to, in regards to this desperation I've seen, especially young filmmakers or, and young screenwriters coming up. They just, they don't know any different. It's kind of like yelling on right. social media. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think, and I think the other, the other, um, the, the disservice and the misconception that exists out there is that you've, you've only got this one shot, right? You walk up and you've got 30 seconds with this person. So get your entire life story out in 30 seconds Get them the script in 30 seconds and press them in 30 seconds with how great you are, how talented you are, how smart you are with your elevator pitch and all this other shit. And it's just not true. You know, I mean, the first I mean, truly, the first thing is to be selfless in the business, you know, and and to authentically take an interest in the other person. I think that's what's what's largely missing in, in a lot of people really, but, but it's, it's for whatever reason, concentrated and exacerbated in people who wish to succeed in the entertainment industry. Um, we are so concentrated on our own hustle and our own, I've got to, I've got to make this in this business that they forget that there's another person across the table who has their same hopes, dreams, fears, concerns, questions, you know, wondering about, you know, how their mom's doing or whatever it is. And I'm going to come at you as hard as I can that you've, you've already lost me. And so the first thing I always say is be, be selfless. I mean, ask what you can do to help that other person first in an authentic way. You know, um, that's, it's such a refreshing thing to be like, first off, I, I thank you. I admire what you do. I, I tell me, you know, tell me more about you you'll, 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 it's going to be amazing how many doors open up for you just by being authentically interested in what the other person has to say. I, so. I, I, I found in my, in my journeys in, in La La Land that when you approach, uh, people in general in the business is always being of service. How can I be of service sure. to you? How yeah. can I help you? That is going to make you stand out so much more than read my script do this for me. Right. Suck, 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 suck. Energy sucker. As opposed to like, look, dude, I'm a big fan of what you do. Is there anything you need? Um, that, you know, I can, I, I can, how can I be of service to you? How can I help yeah. you, uh, with anything? Uh, you know, offer time, offer energy, offer, it, offer services, yeah. uh, you know, like, hey, I, I perfect. Like my parents, yeah. oh, my, my parents own a, a vineyard. Do you, do you need a vineyard? Um, <laughs> Not right. that that's a very, you know, common thing, but, um, things like that. That's a, that's a thing of being of service, um, in, sure. in a relationship. And, and that doesn't happen in 15 seconds. It takes time. No, 
It does take time. Absolutely. And and I actually got that question. I got that question from a writer one time. He said, OK, but what if I only have three minutes with this person? You know, and I said, you do, do not spend that three minutes asking for shit. You know, spend that three minutes talking about how that person has impacted your life. Again, what you can do with them. And then if it's appropriate, say, look, I would love to continue this conversation if if you would like to at your convenience, at your leisure, what have you. Would it, would you mind if I, you know, reached out on some level, whatever that is. And if it's a yes, great. If it's a no, okay. You know, but don't, you're, you're going to get further with that approach than you will with the, here's my script. Here's my, here's my one sheet. Here's this, you know, get this to somebody, or can you make this? Um, and the, and then the other aspect of that is again, you know, building your community, building your network, uh, offering to help those around you who can't do anything for you right now, because that's, again, that's the mark of somebody who is going to be successful. Um, it's, it's amazing to me, the number of people who reach out and say, um, is there anything I can do to help promote you on social media? I've got, I, you know, my, the following might be 500 people, but that's such a kind hearted thing to do to say, what can I do for you? You know, mm-hmm. um, and largely miss, it. um, and then the other thing, too, is just being able to carry on an organic, authentic conversation with somebody is a lost art. We have just <laughs> lost the ability yes. to talk. You know, <laughs> we have you. It's it's shocking how quickly people just dissolve when you try to have a conversation with them. <laughs> like a real like a real conversation. Like a real authentic conversation. You know, uh, it, you know, we're we're so. We're so quick to try and get our shit out and get my agenda out that there is no conversing. There is no true give and take in a conversation or give, you know, give and get that sort of thing. It's just blasting at people, you know. Can we can we discuss a little bit of regards to the politics of of the business a little bit? Because there is sure. it is an unspoken um, uh, it's definitely not taught in film school. Um, right. and generally not spoken a lot in, even in, in education and any sort. So occasionally you'll get nuggets here and there, but there is an unspoken politics involved that filmmakers and screenwriters have no idea. They're, they get caught by a buzzsaw. So perfect example was the TV. Uh, the TV idea. Mm-hmm. We're like, I have a pilot. I'm going to be the showrunner. No, that's not the way this works, dude. Like, you know, you're not. Right. You're not Shonda Rhimes, uh, and even Shonda Rhimes right. didn't get her first show. Right, Shonda Rhimes wasn't Shonda Rhimes back then. Yeah, she wasn't right. Shonda Rhimes either. Aaron Sorkin wasn't Aaron Sorkin when he first showed up, um, oh, and right. that's the delusion I think that a lot of of screenwriters have. So, w- can you talk a little bit about how? Let's say, let's talk in TV first, and then maybe talk in film about like what is this? What is the politics? What are these unspoken words? Like we kind of touched upon it with the fear aspect, where executives are going to cover their ass. And I'm not going to take a risk right. on you and your script when – if I do and it doesn't – I'm out. So th- that's right. that's that's politics. That's a bit of politics. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think – yes. And there's a there's – a, there, again, there's a massive disservice that is done to young writers and, and writers who are coming up. Um, and it happens – again, I mentioned award shows. You know, If you watch any award show that takes place, they're going to announce – the winner of the award show or, you know, of, of the best new television series or best screenwriter or whatever. And as this person is walking to the stage, inevitably the announcer is going to say, this is his first nomination and first win. And this is the first thing he's been developing for the last 25 years. And now he's won this award for 25 years, but he was also doing 50 other things that are in various stages of development. He wasn't doing this one passion project. That suddenly hit. And it wasn't as though this happened overnight and it wasn't a singular effort. You know, to your point about all the writers we just mentioned, they all had careers as baby writers, as failed writers, as writers who um, needed the help of somebody else to mentor them and bring them up and and give them advice and give them, you know, uh, uh, tough love on their project. So that's the biggest thing is that and straight away, writers think, and and a lot of filmmakers think, um, this person was an overnight success. And I think Jordan Peele would be a perfect example of someone who looks like it was overnight, but he had been hustling and working on you know comedy 
for most of his career where then he made yeah. this monumental film or shot not only wrote it but directed it uh get out but it looked like an overnight success like they just showed up right right that exactly right and that's the biggest disservice is that we love in in filmmaking and entertainment we still subscribe to the story. We subscribe to the overnight success because it's a nice narrative. It's wonderful. It's total bullshit. Yeah, the lottery total ticket. Bullshit. The the lottery. Um, I call it the lottery ticket mentality. It's like people think that this is yes. This is the one. This script is going to be the one. This film is going to be the one that blows me up, and I can go live in the Hollywood Hills, have lunch with Spielberg, uh, have dinner with Scorsese, right. and then I hang out with Fincher and Nolan uh, on the weekends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I party with Tarantino. And I party with Tarantino. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And they're all telling me what a genius I am the whole time. Obviously. It's impossible. To, you know, they just constantly tell me how great I am. Exactly. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so that's a big problem. Um, that mentality right there is a big problem because it's such a it's such a, a cold, wet slap in the face when you realize that's not the way this business works at all. Um, and and truthfully, the 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 naked script um, – the script that has no attachments has nothing, you know, except for a really great idea. It takes a, you know, that's not going into production tomorrow. It's not getting greenlit based on that script alone at this point. You know, it's it's so much of it now is to your point about politics. Who's who's in it? Who's directing it? Right? Um, where where can this be shot? All these things that it, it becomes such a bigger part of it. And by the way, uh, as soon as you sell that screenplay, there's a good chance you might get rewritten and never hear about it again. You know, there's so many writers who have made a a, a, a good living uh, careers on scripts they've sold that have never gone into production, mm -hmm. you know, that have never been made or that they've been, been rewritten off of, you know, and then and that's it. So, you know, the ultimately the the, the one of the biggest things is that the the holding in your hand right now is is not the thing that's going to end up on screen without a lot of other thumbprints on it. Um, and, and that's a big reality. Now, can you talk about, uh, and I know you have experienced this, and I think this is something that uh, a lot of screenwriters think this is the truth, but I don't, I don't think they understand the reality of it, is they think that there's no good writing. In Hollywood, that there, that everyone is waiting for the the script that's going to be like. There's just no good stuff that gets produced, um, or, or like there's just a lack of good writing in Hollywood, which is the absolute opposite. I've read scripts totally. that were so amazing. I'm like, why isn't this a movie? Like, why didn't this right. win the Oscar? And I've read tons of those scripts. So there's an illusion in in the in the screenwriter's mind, especially one that's outside of the party, thinks like, oh, if they're just waiting for my script that's genius with well, the ego and that's a whole other conversation right. um but they think that there might be a lack of good script it's not about the lack of good uh good content it's the now before it it's like anything in, in this industry before a good script was enough before a good pitch was enough mm. right and now a good script still not enough because there's another 10 or 20 good scripts on that table alone it's what Absolutely. is it packaged with where is it coming from is it hitting the time period is it the right place, the right time, with the right project, right. with the right group of filmmakers involved? So, can yeah, you touch absolutely. a little bit about that? I'll give you. I'll give you a perfect example of that. When I was back at Storyline, we were we were uh, taking out a pitch. This is before Orange Is the New Black by about four years. Um, we took out a women in prison show around town, and we took it to NBC. Uh, it was a it was a uh, a woman Maria Magenti was the writer. She's fantastic. Uh, she was sort of an, a co EP level. She'd written on some some series. She was ready to take that next leap and become the EP showrunner. We what year was show. this? What year was this? This was this was two thousand. I want to say two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Okay, 2009. okay, two thousand nine. Okay. Ben Silverman is president of NBC. Back okay, then, right. Um, two thousand nine. We take this pitch out. And uh, she sells it in the room. She sells it in the room to NBC with Ben Silverman, who's like, I love it. I get it. Women in prison. I'm all over it. Right. And we walk out and we're like, fuck, yeah, man, this shit is easy. You know, we're saying, <laughs> who says films hard? You know, that was the second thing we had sold in like two weeks. And it was, it was, you know, good. It was great. Good. I, was, yeah. I was like, who says this shit's hard? I am a genius. You're right. I am a genius. Mom. <laughs> Let's go to Spielberg's. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and so. So we sell this thing on a Thursday, Friday, 
variety hits. Ben Silverman out at NBC. He'd been fired on Friday, and that <laughs> show died right there, right? And so we look, we read right and we're like, fuck. And I remember we, we called up the executives at NBC. We're like, hey, so how you doing? And they're like, don't worry. It's we're, We still love this. We love the series. It's great. It, it was that. That was it. It died. Did they ever make a it, pilot it never, of it or no? Never made a pilot. Uh, we, we, had the, we had the pilot written. It was beautiful. Never happened. And then years later, of course, Orange is the New Black comes out. Um, and I'm like, all right, well, that's it. You know, I, I, at least the instincts were right. But this, the, all of that to say – there's any number of reasons why your stuff is, is not getting made or why things that you think are not great are getting made. You know, um, there have been so many passion projects that that um, that started out as something really great that uh, ended up not being great. There's a lot of reasons why, to your point about is it the right time, is it the right demographic, is it the right this and that, all that stuff. There's a reason why things get made that we think we're like we sit back and we're like, well, that was terrible. Well, nobody nobody sits you know nobody sits down and be like, well, I can't wait to make a terrible movie, you know. Um, they're making stuff because they they truly believe that this is going to be something fantastic. Well, it's, it's um, but it's kind of like when well, like when Passion of the Christ hit, that everybody wanted faith based material because they're like, right. oh my god, there's a lot of money in it, and now. Uh, because of COVID, everyone's like, well, animation's big. So there might be an animation script that would have never gotten a second look. But right now, because of the market, it might get – Well, and that's the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely, and you're exactly right. And and the, the other thing that, that writers tend to do um, is try and chase a trend. Uh-huh. Right? So you'll hear – you know, so you – again, you're, somebody's going to be listening to this right now and they'll be like, oh, rom-com's hot. I should write a rom-com. You know, or, or I you. – and then they're going to spend six months to a year writing their rom-com <laughs> and then by the time they get it out there, that trend is gone. You know, and so and then we're back on to sp- space invasion thrillers or whatever. Um, you know, that's that's the difference. Chasing that trend, whatever you see in the theater that you think you're going to write – you're done you're already done you know (laughs) that's done you know chasing faith-based movies because that anomaly hit in such a big way you know it just doesn't make sense um write write stuff that that's appealing to you you know that you that turns you on because inevitably if it does it there's it's gonna find an audience somewhere you know do you remember remember after pulp fiction hit how many bad pulp fiction ripoffs came out afterwards oh yeah Oh, it was, it was bad. It was really bad. Well, and, and then really bad. And then the bad, like, Tarantino knockoff dialogue that they would try and do. Oh, yeah, they were trying to do that. Yeah. Not realizing what Tarantino does with his dialogue. They would sit there and be like, you know, oh, this this is very Tarantino-esque. No, it's not because you're not Tarantino, you know? Right. Like, or it's very Sorkin-esque. Or very, like, you can't. Right, or very Sorkin. Right. You can't. Right. It's th- that's that. Exactly right. Right. That's exactly right. And there's a rhythm to them and that and that's why they hit. You know, you you can't you will not get ahead trying to be like to my point earlier. You know, I went into th- film school thinking I was going to be Spielberg. Well, there's one of him, you know, and that and you're not it, bro. So find find you and that's where you got to live. Yeah, w- without question. Now, wh- how can screenwriters better position themselves post COVID? Is there anything that you can think of that because the landscape is changing. So there's, I mean, January 2019, uh, 2020 is a lot different than now. And the yeah. whole industry has changed. And I guarantee you, January 2021 is going to be a whole lot different yeah. than we are now. So is there anything that you can suggest for screenwriters to do to kind of position themselves to be a little bit ahead of the curve? Not that you know what's going to happen, but just anything yeah. that can maybe stack the deck a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the the biggest thing right now is is the networking and direct access to people who can help get projects made is unprecedented you know everybody is at home reading everybody is at home looking for something to do um so being able to connect with people and network with people um filmmakers again other screenwriters producers executives whomever it is do not be sitting out waiting for productions to get rolling because by that time you're already behind the game, right? So you need to be getting your work into the market right now. You need to be getting eyeballs on your material. Um, I mean, we touched on stage 32. I mean, the, you know, I, I, I constantly hear from writers who email me. I constantly hear from writers on a platform who 
asked that question. How do I get out? And I said, get on the platform, get networking with people, um, be able to connect with people. Um, you know, and, and I say connect, connect with me. I mean, you know, my email is j.merch at stage 32.com. Um, write to me, let me know what you're working on because if you're not getting your stuff out there right now, you're doing yourself a massive disservice. So that's one. So, so being able to network and connect with other writers or filmmakers, people who are at home reading. Um, and then the second thing is again, know, know what's not going to hit. It's hard to like, you know, it's hard to read the tea leaves, obviously, you know, nobody knows, <laughs> nobody knows. nobody's ever known what people want. You know, I mean, that's, that's just the reality. Nobody's should, ever known what people want. Should you quote, should you quote William Goldman? Uh, at this point, right. yeah, just nobody, <laughs> exactly. nobody knows I mean, yeah. nothing. No, yeah, <laughs> no, there's nobody anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. We're we're making our best guesses, um, but the best guess says, like I said, you know, I'm I'm not going to be looking at, um, you know, post apocalyptic uh, virus movies, you know, right now. Contagion I, two, Contagion two, and outbreak two, not so much. Right, no, not yeah, exactly right. Well, you know, it's so funny because I had somebody somebody point. Well, they said, well, you know, Net, uh, Netflix is, you know, has the number two and three movies are outbreak and contagion. I said, okay, well, those are made. Again, you're not going to remake that movie and be like, well, here here's my version too. You know, it's too look soon. for something too soon. Yeah, it's too soon. It's too soon. I mean, and I, again, to to another point. How many how many nine eleven movies came out post nine eleven, and how many of them were successful? Like that's that's the other was thing, there a you know? successful nine eleven? I mean, I know that Oliver Stone nine, did one. There was an Oliver Stone one. There was a Tom Hanks version of one. Uh, Which one? Uh, there was a, that Which was extremely was loud, about? incredibly close. Oh like yeah, that. yeah. That was that was like kind of like an off yeah, off nine eleven thing. It was nine yeah. eleven adjacent. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and, and yeah, Sandra Bullock. Yeah, Sandra Bullock was in that. Right, and then and they're United ninety three. All these projects, right? I, I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't show up for a single one of those. Nobody wanted to see I don't, it. I lived through that shit. I we we all watch that, and I don't need to. I don't need to go back to that place. What I want, and what I think a lot of audience wanted, was to break out and have escapist entertainment. Do you know this is interesting? The number one movie uh, in twenty. Uh, I'm sorry. In in two thousand two, made three hundred and fifty million dollars domestically was my big fat greek wedding yeah, of course right that movie has zero conflict it's just a big you know it, it's a it's it's a fun movie it's a fun romp don't get me wrong right that the the sequel to that made something like 12 years later made like 57 million dollars it made no money right yeah. comparatively but people want like you're coming out of 9 11 you're going out of coming into an afghan war right you've also got you got iraq war on the on the horizon and people are like, I just want to fucking have a good time, man. Like, let me see what this Greek wedding shit's all about. And that's what that's what people showed up to. Right place, you right know? time, right product. Right place, right time, right product. You know. And again, but and and specificity to that person, that writer, that character. You know, Nia Vardalos. You know, that was so specific to her, but it was universal in terms of themes. And so that's the other thing I would say thematically look thematically there might be projects that come out that deal with isolation cabin fever uh something that you don't see that can kill you like a predator whatever it is right thematically those things will exist certainly but at the same time make it specific to the story you want to tell what's resonating with you right now and that's that's the only way to really get ahead of a curve is to think about what's what's you're internalizing yeah i mean after covid hit i mean i've been I've gotten 20, 30 COVID short films mm -hmm. about, about COVID, about COVID. And I'm just yeah. like, guys, I don't, I don't want to watch a movie about COVID. I don't want to watch a short about COVID. Yeah. And yeah. there's not going to be a COVID. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't, I don't think there's going to be a no. COVID movie that that's going to break out. <laughs> no, I mean, I talked to, I talked to a universal executive who said we've been pitched 70, 70, 70, covid movies we've passed on every single one of them we're not making that movie you know we're just not gonna make that movie no you know it's, you know just because it's happening right now doesn't mean it again specifically because it's happening right now doesn't mean there's an appetite for it you know it was and like the other, the, and the other, like, no i know? was gonna say like nam when nam happened when vietnam happened yeah. it took it took a while before vietnam films happened and it was like probably what another 10 years later before platoon and 
Hamburger right. Hill and Full Metal sure. Jacket and and that that whole section of time where Vietnam films were a thing. Right. Um, but they didn't come out yeah. in 60, 69. No, no, not at all. <laughs> because they were wa- yeah, you're watching it on TV. Exactly right, man. You know, yeah. I mean, and then you look at, you know, at post post depression, World War II is going on. It's musicals. It's musical comedies. It's light fair. Like, right. That's what people wanted to show up for. You know, um, again, I, my my wife and I have watched nearly every Netflix romantic comedy, you know, that, that they had to offer. And that and that's not you know, that's uh, we're not alone in that. You know, there's a reason why those things are having a resurgence. And that's what and that's also part of one of the reasons why Disney Plus is doing as well. I mean, they got what, over 50 million last heard. I heard 50 million yeah. subscribers in in what? F- yeah. Five, four months. It took right. HBO like four years to get 10 million subscribers. Yeah. Well, and to, and to your point, too, about Sandler and knowing your brand, we know what we're showing up for when we show up for a Disney product. You know, we just know they've done they've been they've had a hundred years to do it, but they've got such a solid brand. You know exactly what you're getting when you sign up for that. You know? Yeah, that's going to be the and, and they've got a, a library that's gigantic Ugh. and owns everything you can yeah. think of. Um, so there, there's there, there's going to be something there that people subscribe to or subscribe for. Yeah, you know? it's it's. I, I just got HBO Max um, the other day because I just need to have. I just need to know that I have access to friends. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to know if I want to watch it. It's there. That's all I yep. need to know. Um, Absolutely. But we're we you know we're going through ballers right now. We're just fin- you know, yeah. going, I hadn't, I'm catching up on all Great these show. series that I never. So like I think True Detective I've never seen. I gotta go to True Detective. Oh, yep. It's so good I hear. First season is incredible. First season yeah. is incredible. I'll leave it at that. Second yeah. and third is it worth second and third or? Sec- second was second was rushed, man. I mean it it, it really they they had such like, I don't it wasn't meant to be a, a a recurring thing. They were supposed to have that one series and right. then they it blew up and it was fantastic and then they they sort of hurried the the second season and you can tell you can tell. How about the third? Any good? I don't even know if I watched it. I don't think I. I don't, oh, I did. I started. I started, and it felt the same way. I felt. Right, it, so it felt just rough. watch season one, and and we're out. Okay, season good. one will will blow you away. I just I just walked. I, we just finished up. Um, how to get away with murder? Oh yeah, the whole mm-hmm. series. It's a great right. series. Wonderful writing. Yeah. Like wonderful, wonderful writing. Um, Absolutely. It's just. Oh, there's so much stuff, dude. There's so much content there's out a, there. There's so much content, and and the other thing too is. Because there's so much content, how quickly are you? How quickly do you abandon a series that's not working for you? I mean, you know, or or some, or a film or anything. If you can get, you know, gone, I'll get five minutes into something. I'll be like, no, nope, fuck it, I don't like it. You didn't hook me, you know. I I'll got, get an I, episode. I got ten, you know? fifteen minutes, maybe. I give maybe a one episode or two uh, of a show. Yeah. Like we just finished, yeah. we should, like a little while ago, Shameless, the entire ten seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Yeah. Bones. The entire yeah. twelve seasons, <laughs> like it's just yeah. like it, it's it's fast. It's it's. But now I'm catching up on all of these shows that I've always wanted to watch, right. and now, and now well, I got HBO. So I'm like, oh great, now I get all the HBO stuff. I'm not sure if I'll right. get Peacock, but maybe. Well, and that's the other thing too is is you know I was, I was talking to somebody and we said, all right, realistically, there's Netflix, there's going to be Amazon because Amazon is it's Prime, a, it's, and it's, it's, you, it's free, you know, it's, it's free, built in. It's built in if you, if you you know um, Disney Plus. I've kids, and then you've so, got yeah. all of these, yeah, and you've got all of these other ones that are going to be kicking around, jockeying for fourth position, fifth position, what you know, and are, and a, at a certain point, some people there's going to be fatigue where people are like, I don't need to buy you know Lifetime's streaming service or whatever, you know, I don't I don't want that. I want oh no these. It's going to be like you know it's almost you know what it's almost like it's almost like the the original like big three networks, you know. You had the big three networks. You had it was those were what you had, and you know, and there's more control in a in a person's hand right now. But ultimately, the, I you know, who knows how long some of these other streamers are gonna are gonna be able to keep it up. You know, I think I agree. I agree with you on the on the top three now because Disney has positioned itself in the in that conversation with authority, um, and there's no one that's going to dethrone them from that because they just own family. They just and right, right. now everybody wants family. Everybody wants light fair. Right. And they own all the family and light fair um, between yeah, Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar, Disney, and even now Fox and, and, Fox. and Simpsons, and the entire Simpsons, Simpsons catalog on there. Exactly. So they own all of that stuff. I think that uh, HBO Max, Peacock, their CBS All Access, 
there, those are some of the bigger ones, but like, like lifetime. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not going right. to spend, is it 99 right. cents a month? Five VOD. Yeah. It's, right. it's, if it's 99 cents a month, then maybe, but it, these, and there's over what, three or 4,000. I have a streaming channel. Right. I have my own streaming channel, but it's very right. specific to filmmakers and I'm not going after 10,000, 100,000 followers. Right. Um, right. It's much more specific. Um, but these other channels like that have major overheads, like, yeah. a, like imagine, like, would well, you, would you spend three ninety nine for lifetime? Like, it doesn't make any no, sense. It, no, it, it doesn't. And, and, and that exactly. And, and the reason, again, to the point earlier about walking into a, a home during a holiday season, there's a Hallmark channel on it's because it's easily deliverable and it's part of a package as part of a bundle that your satellite or cable provider give you, you're not going to find the 65, 7 year old woman who's going to get online and try and purchase the Hallmark VOD, you know, <laughs> are you kidding me? They've got, you, it's, it's just not going to happen, you know? Um, so that market is already razor thin and that's, you know, and, and again, you, you're going to, you're going to see, a, I think, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see all these consolidate into one package. And then ironically, you basically have taken, Cable, cable and satellite. Out of cable and satellite. You've put it on the internet, and now we just got cable and satellite on the internet. You know, but you're I, right. I don't think it's going to happen though. No, I, I just I don't think everyone's going to get like YouTube TV. I have YouTube TV, which mm-hmm. gives you the local and it has a ton of other channels. So it's like my version of cable. Um, but you but you record anything and everything you want endlessly. Um, right. Which is which is fantastic, and Hallmark and all these other channels sure. are on there, but. I know someone's trying to figure that out. Someone's trying to do this one. Apple is actually trying to do it. It's trying to put them all in their, they right. can't come like it's, it's like, why would Netflix do that? Like, right. Absolutely. No. Yeah. Net, though, Netflix, I, it just doesn't make sense for those guys. I mean, again, taking like the big three again, will always exist. Um, what's, you know, it's going to be interesting because some, what some of these studios did is they made the mistake in my opinion of trying to build a streaming service like they built their networks or they built their studio or whatever it is, where it's all of a sudden they just flooded these positions where, well, we've always had this at a network. We've always had this as a studio. Let's just put it on the internet and we'll just do that version of it. And it's like, that's not the way you work. That's not the way it works. You know, Um, you've got to be nimble and you've got to be super small and very targeted and then make sure that you're again, making things that are on brand that, that people are going to show up for. And you don't need to be, you know, a part of that if you're, if you don't have that audience. Yeah. And I think HBO is positioned itself. It, it, it is out of all of those people, HBO has a brand and right. has, it has a specific brand that it connects with Warner brothers and that totally. kind of, it's been Warner brothers style since the beginning, that gritty, you know, from yeah, back, yeah, back in absolutely. the ga- the gangster days, like, yeah, you know, movies, back absolutely. in the thirties and forties. Yeah. And HBO and HBO had HBO go before that. So people are already kind of, uh, accustomed to, I can watch this online at my leisure, you know, and then they just made it, you know, obviously um, expand that that brand, like you said, and it works and so well. The one thing we haven't talked about is there's a, there's an elephant in the room in regards to streaming, which is Apple, which mm-hmm. if they want to, um, they could demolish everybody. If they truly right. want to, they have the budget, they have the money. And a lot of the content that they've been creating has been not as well received as they would have hoped. They haven't had a breakout yet. Um, right. They haven't had a breakout. I I just signed up for it because there was a show I wanted. To, I think I wanted to watch the Beastie Boy documentary. So I'm like, oh, okay, that was it. Three ninety nine, right. fine. It's like a rental. I'll take it up right. for the month. I'll make sure to right. cancel it. Um, but they're a big. They're 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 an unknown quantity yet. And mm-hmm. I and I, I don't know what you feel about this, but I do think that you've got Apple, Google, and Facebook all sitting on the sidelines. Waiting to see what happens, and they're going to start acquiring some of the studios. There is, I've said this uh, publicly a bunch of times. I think the three best studios that are in the best position to survive is Disney, Warner's, and Universal because they're the most diversified. Right. But Sony, Paramount, Lionsgate, MGM, they don't have the diversification, um, or or the franchises to be frank. Right. Um, that right. to survive in this environment. Where Apple could come in and just buy Paramount's library, which right. is massive, and right. or buy Sony that has a massive right. library as well. I think that, and then when that happens, the whole playing field changes. Imagine if Apple bought Sony tomorrow and has yeah. all of Sony content. 
now it becomes a sure. much more interesting conversation to get soon to get Apple TV. Right. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, and the, that's the thing, you know, it's so interesting because historically so many studios have been acquired by, they'll be acquired by, you know, Paramount was a Gulf and Western company. Then I think it became Bacardi. Bacardi, yeah. Yeah. Bacardi, yeah. And, 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 yeah. and then you had Seagram's bought Universal and then they quit. The problem, I mean, the, the issue is you got, you know, people want to be in the movie business. They want to be in entertainment. And so, you, you know, these, these moguls are no different. These corporations are no different. They see, they see it as a line item, certainly. But then, you know, if, if, Google or Apple or whomever goes in and buys a Paramount, they're cleaning house. I mean, oh, the, like yeah. even the real estate alone to maintain, you know, and even <laughs> and even the you know the idea of having to try and keep up a distribution machine, Why? right, and then feed that distribution machine. It's a it's a massive undertaking, you know. Well, that's, I think I it, mean, that's, hmm? but if you look at Apple, Apple's business model, they don't care. They, they they are very unique in the position because – and maybe Google to a certain extent, but they're a hardware company. They want to sell right. iPads, iPhones, computers. Right. And all of a sudden, you buy your new iPhone, you've got a year subscription of Apple TV for free. Sure. And you get – and it's just another way to connect the, the consumer with an Apple experience. They don't care about what – what Hollywood does now and their business models. It's not even in their ballpark like Netflix. Right. Don't right. oh screw, Marty, you want two hundred million dollars and complete carte blanche to do whatever the hell you want? Here you go. Why? Right. Because they don't need a box office return. They right. They have other parameters, other other metrics that they go after. Right. Absolutely. And you know, and I remember years ago I said the thing that would and this is when Netflix was still mailing you DVDs. You remember that? You remember of course. Netflix of course. Mail DVDs. Um, I, I look a lot younger than I am, sir. I appreciate that. Right. But no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember I remember getting the DVDs in the mail and I remember thinking like, holy shit, if if Netflix can figure out a way to do digital streaming and they can go worldwide, they're going to be unstoppable, right? Because those are the two th- I mean, they just got to jump on Everybody. Oh, by a um, decade. Terms de- of- a decade for Disney and, and for the yeah. major. It's taken them a th- 2008 right. is when they hit. So it's been 12 years right. that they've been thinking about opening up their own streaming service. Right. Right. And well, it, ex- exactly. That's exactly right. And you know, and, and it's 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 interesting because you know, I'm a massive Disney, the business of Disney, the history of Disney oh. fan. Oh, me too. So, so the idea of you know Eisner and Katzenberg coming over from Paramount to oh. run Disney and and really you know and Saved you it. know one of the one of the things Frank Wells said he was like I, you know I think it was Frank Wells that said this he said I open up a door and behind that door is money every door I open up has money behind it at Disney because they weren't you know that was the that was the advent of VHS and they had Disney had not released any of their library on VHS they wouldn't do it uh, out of principle. And Eisner was like, well, fuck that. Like they made, they, the VHS saved Disney, you know, in the early eighties and, 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 and into the late eighties, um, as a result of that, you know, to, to not jump on a streaming platform and streaming bandwagon and be able to and get that. I mean, you're right. They came in 10 years later and look where they are now. I mean, they're already, they caught you know, up pretty quickly. They caught up pretty quick. You know, Apple, Apple's interesting because Apple, and a lot of these other um, streaming services that have a ton of money, Quibi is an. I, I we can definitely touch on Quibi. Yeah, let's talk um, about Quibi in a second. I mean, they're bringing in massive filmmakers, throwing massive amounts of money at them because, again, they are hoping they are hoping that content's going to hit. They're hoping that if you hear Spielberg's doing something with Quibi, you're going to try and and get a, a Quibi subscription, right? Or Apple, same thing, you know. Um, Netflix, same thing. They, they're they're pulling these big names away from studios, um, or or at least uh, um, in competition with studios, because you're right. The Netflix will say, "Do whatever you want, Marty." You know, you you need to you need you need uh, ten million more dollars, twenty million more dollars to do some more de aging. Fine, you know, we'll take it. Um, it's it's a totally it's a totally different ball game now because there is so much money, and these these companies. Um, don't have to. They don't have a corporate overlord that's sitting there, be like, "Hey, watch your, you know, you've got to make something to hit, and, or you're, or you're done. You know, you're, you're fired." And I think out of all the out of all these companies, um, the, all the ones we've spoken about, other than Quibi, Netflix is very vulnerable because they don't have a diversified business plan. Mm. Uh, all the other ones we're talking about are diversified. 
every other right. streaming service, and they all have other ways of making money. Where Netflix, right. it's the one revenue stream. Yeah, they license out Stranger Things to T-shirts occasionally, but generally speaking, <laughs> that's 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 it. So if that dries up for whatever reason, if something happens to that revenue stream, the entire company goes down. Where if Disney Plus shut down tomorrow, Disney's fine. If HBO right. Max shut down tomorrow, Warner's is fine. Um, so right. it's really – it's interesting that they are – they're the big boy, but they are vulnerable in a sense. And we are going to sure. get to that critical threshold of there's no more people um, to to – no more subscribers. Like they've already – Netflix is it's so beyond the US now. They're just trying to go worldwide now. Sure. But at a certain point, they're just like you're going to hit – you know, you're going to hit that threshold yeah. and you're not going to. Right. So then it's now I'm spending money just to maintain what I have, let alone to attract new subscribers. We are going to get to that in the next, I say in the next 10 years or so. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely. And, and to your point about Disney, Bob Iger famously said, like, I, we don't make movies. What we make are products and the movies fit into those products. Right. So, you know, uh, Frozen 2 is a commercial for every Frozen backpack, lunchbox, oh. uh, Barbie doll. Like, that's what that – theme park ride, all that. So what what Netflix doesn't have, to your point, you're exactly right, is an a, ability to really cross-collateralize those things and, and be able to, you know, have different business groups talking to each other right. to really figure out, all right, how do we make the most possible money out of this? There, in that, I wrote a whole book on it called The Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, which is how it create ancillary product lines, which is basically the Disney right. model. I mean, Disney started this back in the 30s. I mean, when, yeah. or in the 20s, later, late 20s, early 30s. Like right now, as we're speaking, someone bought a Mickey Mouse t-shirt somewhere in the world. Absolutely. And they're still generating revenue off of that IP. Um, and I actually did a whole episode of, of how I actually went into the corporate filings from 2019, I think it was. Yeah, 2019, mm-hmm. and they made 70 billion gross. And then right. I wanted to see how much is actually movies, exhibition right. of movies, which is what a studio is supposed to be doing. And right. it ended up being that um, out of number one was uh, – you probably know this, but number one was um, theme parks and resorts, yep. which are t- taking right. a hit right right about now. Not, not, yeah. not, not, not a growth 30, industry. $30 million a day they're losing. Yeah, it's Consider- not, a, yeah. not a growth industry at the moment. But right. generally speaking, right. in the normal world, it's a good situation. Yeah. The next was licensing for um, networks, cables, ESPN, yep. that thing. Mm-hmm. Then came movies, then came merchandise. But the merchandise also has to be included in the theme parks and resorts because they yep. sell a ton of merchandise. So it ended up being about 15% of the entire $70 billion was generated off of like box office and receipts yep. or exhibition of the movie. Everything else was around that. And that's what people have such a hard time understanding is that Disney not only – and I think it started with Eisner – when he mm-hmm. when he came in, he'd say, I mean, Eisner saved Disney. There's yeah. just no oh, question. There's no Bob Iger without without Eisner. Um, exactly right. Yeah. Regardless of how he left, uh, <laughs> but right. uh, regardless of how it ended the relationship, but without right. Eis- without Eisner, there is no Disney today. Um, that he started building this infrastructure out back then. They're like, look, there's a right. lot of assets here. We're going to start building out a system and infrastructure to start, and then that's how their merchandising came out. Then the theme yeah. park started pumping out. Then all this stuff. To the point where now it's just a money machine. You're just like, I have a buddy of mine who works at Disney. Uh, he's an animator. He worked on Frozen, mm-hmm. and I and he they go. We brought in all of our. Uh, they got brought in by the the brass, and they wanted to show all the animators how they make their money. So they took every mm-hmm. single animated film and they broke it down into categories. So like, okay, thirty percent merch, thirty percent mm-hmm. theatrical, and thirty percent uh, home video. And then they got and it's like and they like you know Aladdin and and they did mm-hmm. all of those right. Then they got the Frozen. Right. It was 90% merch. Yeah. And 10%. Um, and that movie made like a billion and a half dollars. Yeah. yeah. It and made I, a ton of money. He goes, do you know how much we made, how much Disney made on the on the dresses? The little dresses that like my daughters bought. Like they bought two or three sets right. of it back in the day. Mm-hmm. A billion. On just, yeah. the, on just the dresses. On just the dresses. Yeah. On just the dresses. And that's what people, like that's what I'm trying to let people know about independent filmmakers like there is a way to do that model in a smaller fashion where you can create ancillary product lines and create other revenue streams on an independent standpoint to be able to build up a business that makes sense right and so on but that's that's the business and that's why that's why paramount sony lionsgate they don't Mm -hmm. have that they are stuck in the 90s (laughs) 
Yeah, absolutely. No, that that's exactly right. And and the 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 trouble is, it's very difficult to ramp. You know, look, Paramount's. I think I think Paramount has like Great America, right? Great America is like a like a theme park that exists. Oh, in like I've, one, I've, I've never, never heard of never, it. Heard, <laughs> never heard. It's huge. Never, it's, it's it's monstrous. Not, yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's yeah, everybody knows about it. Great America. Everyone goes to at everybody the end of the Super right. Bowl. Goes where are you going? Great America. No, nobody. Right. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, you know. That's that's going to be the big struggle, like you said about Netflix and, and all of these other streamers. But you know, as a you're exactly right. As a as a screenwriter, you you don't want to come from a position necessarily, in my opinion, of being like, okay, here's what a lunchbox looks like. Here's what a a, a Barbie doll looks like. Here, that yeah. that's not necessarily it. But I think you're a thousand percent right when you have to say, okay, how does this fit into a larger conversation about what, like, how we're going to monetize this. Um, because ultimately that's, you're right. Box offices around box office around the world is, is shrinking. Um, largely, you know, there's, there's more expensive tickets. Uh, there's fewer tickets sold, more expensive tickets, bigger, bigger box office for bigger movies. But if you're doing it on the independent side, if you're doing something that's, you know, sub, sub, you know, uh, $20 million or $5 million, (laughs) whatever it is. Right. Um, You've got to figure out a way that that's going to live for a longer period of time, you know, um, and that's that's the biggest challenge that writers have and, and trying to figure out, OK, you know, if this is, you know, if this is a story that I that I, I desperately want to tell, I get that. How do I get somebody else to see that it's something that desperately needs to be told? But you know? also but with screenwriters, though, shouldn't they? Like, what's your opinion? Should a screenwriter write a, a film, an independent film that could be done for a million or two million bucks, to and see, did you have a better chance of that getting made if it's solid, than going into the studio system and trying to get and, and try to play that game? Because that game you could play for a decade and not and and, and not get anywhere, right. um, without question. So, right. what is the better place to be? Like, where where would be a stronger position? I hey, I produced this. This is something I produced. It was mm-hmm. financially good, um, and they made money with it. Right. Here's my next five projects, or yeah, that's, yeah. or I have a project here with no attachments on it. Help me. <laughs> right. No, you're exactly right. No, you're you're exactly right. Go make. You know, go if you're writing something, write something that can be produced uh, sub sub to two, three million dollars. Right. And and probably you can do a really good project. I mean, this is not bullshit. You can do a really good project for sub a million dollars oh, yeah. and still and still break out and get noticed. Right. You're exactly right. It's so much better to have a produced credit that you can point to and say, hey, watch this. As opposed to, hey, read this, you know, it's just it's 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 the nature of how you how you are able to be, to your point, entrepreneurial and get your project going. Um, The biggest, I think, mistake writers make is they think I'm a writer, period, full stop. And that's and that's that limits you because you need to be a writer, a writer producer. You need to think like a producer. You need to think like a filmmaker. You need to think you need to think like a distributor on some points to our point about earlier about who's actually seeing this movie right now. Right. Why would I as a financier put five million dollars, 10 million dollars, 20 million dollars into a covid movie? I'm not doing it. Right. But if I can put less than a million dollars into something that is, you know, is a is a um, uh, big fat Greek wedding type style, whatever it is in that vein or in that theme and whatever it is, that's that's my safer bet. So you're right. I mean, I think that it's very much, you know, rather than trying to straight away go knock on the door of a studio, um, because ultimately, though, you know, there's there's a handful of writers that studios are will approve, will work with, whatever it is. You know, to your point about politics, I was a development executive for for many years, and we had our lists. We had our rom com list. We had our thriller list. We had our boxes. horror list. We had our boxes. Right, yeah. We had our boxes, right? And and we would and we and you know we would get a project or we, we would ha- come up with a concept and we'd say, okay, who are our five writers we're going to go to? Right? She's busy. He's busy. He's writing in this. He, this last draft wasn't that great that he turned in. Okay, it's this guy, right? Or this girl, and we would come in, and and that's how you know you know you pick. You wouldn't as a studio executive. Um, go out and blast out online. Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, looking to write a rom-com. Anybody, anybody got some ideas out there? You know? 
like you, you, as a studio executive, you were, you were, you're, you're trapped by the, that sort of system, you know, and, and, you know, you're, you're certainly always looking for, for writers, but you're looking for writers from certain sources, right? And that's it's why it's a gilded so cage, it's like a gilded Absolutely. cage. <laughs> you know? And, and you're, or you're going out to the aid, you know, you were going out to the, the agencies when, when writers still had agents, you would go out to the that's agencies. Right. We haven't even talked about. We haven't even talked about that. We haven't talked about that yet. You know, there's so much shit looming down the road. Um, <laughs> you know, you'd go to you. You say, "Hey, get, who are your rom com writers?" And they'd be like, "Well, this guy wrote this. She wrote this. She wrote this. She wrote this. Great. Send me samples." You know, now, but now writers have so much more power in their hands to actually write and get get shit out there into Produced. the market, into the world. Produce, find producers, find financiers, find other filmmakers. Again, I can't stress this enough. You know, it's it's through I mean through stage thirty two, um, we had a writer who entered one of our screenwriting competitions, our our search for new blood contest. She won that contest. We set her up on a meeting with a manager. That manager set her up on a meeting with an agent. That team got her a studio canal picture. So in under a year, she went from winning a screenwriting contest on stage thirty two to writing for Studio Canal, right, adapting a project. That was totally in her hands. She had an incredible amount of ability, right? And she had a, a stack of scripts at home, by the way. That wasn't her only script she wrote. But she went into that man that meeting with with a manager. Um, it was it was Jake Wagner who was over at um, uh, Good Fear at the time, uh, and she said, "Yeah, I, I wrote this script, and and I've got a stack of other stuff." He's like, "Great, signs are in the room. Get her set up with Verve, and then they get her this this for her first paid gig in under a year, right?" That and by the way, you know, she was a lawyer by trade, you know, so it wasn't like she was sitting there grinding away, you know, querying people. She was she was, you know, um, uh, she entered this contest. And again, that was totally in her control, you know, and that's as a writer. That's how you have to be thinking now. All these avenues have to be open to you. So let's real, t- real quickly before before we finish. I, I, let's touch about this whole agency thing. I actually okay. was talking. I was actually talking to because uh, I'd heard about it, but I didn't know the details about it. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to this uh, very well known uh, screenwriter, um, mm-hmm. a friend of mine. That uh, he was explaining it to me. He was on the phone with me. He was like, "Oh no, this is what happened, and this is why." Uh, you know, we were talking mm-hmm. about a project. I'm like, "Oh, should we send it over to your agent?" And they're like. No, no, no. We we don't have agents yeah. anymore. And I'm like, what do you, right. what do you what do you mean? You're like right. a big screenwriter. He's like, I'd heard something was like some rumblings going on, but I didn't hear about it. And he's like, no, this is what happened. And right. just like everything else that's going on, like like you were saying earlier, that we don't. I think that no one's going to go back into a car to drive an hour for a 30 minute meeting anymore. I think everyone's right. going to get screw that. We're going to do a Zoom meeting. Yeah, because we can do, do this. Yeah. Now, because we're forced to deal with it. I think now writers are going, I don't, why do I need to give 10% away to an agent? I can, I'm good. I don't, I, I, I'm living. Yeah. (laughs) So what is, what happened? So what happened? Yeah. And and meanwhile, an agent is going to say, well, wait, why am I trapped at this agency when I can go be a manager and a producer and take a smaller (laughs) client, you know, roster and go do my own shit? Why am I again, working for a gigantic agency where I'm just trying to get my client's commission, you know, um, no, it's. I mean, I don't know. Have you have you touched upon this at all? I mean, I've with, never with touched the upon. I've never touched upon the WGA um, situation okay. with with the agencies. Okay. I, 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 mean, I don't think. I think we've glanced down it, but we haven't like gotten into the weeds a little bit. But if you right. want to explain it to people, that'd be fine. Sure. I mean, so so basically, the idea was um, years ago there was you know initially there there was this idea that an agent would represent a piece of talent, a writer, a filmmaker, whomever it was. And in exchange for getting that person a job, they would get 10% of that person's salary. So agents are incentivized to work for their clients, to hustle and get them jobs, and also get them the best deal possible because that would get them the highest commission possible. That is the the most simple definition of representation. So ultimately what happened was, to our our point earlier about um, packaging and trying to make your project more valuable – Agents at a certain point uh, started to say, well, wait, if we have this script, we can also put it with this director who's also a client and we can put it with these one, two, three pieces of talent who are also clients. And we'll be able to take this out as a whole package to a studio, a network, what have you, and then sell it there. 
Now, we won't necessarily take the commission from the creator of the show or the writer. We won't take that 10%, but we're going to take an overall packaging fee that comes out of what the budget of the show would be from the network, right? Or from the residuals or from the back end or whatever it is. And so ultimately, the writers are, you know, making their fees on this project. They're not being commissioned, but then they, as as these gigantic shows, Walking Dead, Breaking Friends. Bad, yeah, Friends, Friends, all yeah. these shows start making crazy residuals. These agencies are making incredible amounts of money that their that their uh, clients aren't seeing at all. And so the clients are saying, "Well, wait a second. How are you <laughs> making?" hundreds of millions of dollars a year on this show that I created and I'm not seeing a fraction of that, right? I'm getting whatever little checks that we're getting for residual. So, and on the agency side, the agents are saying, well, yeah, sure, we're taking this packaging fee, but do you remember that pilot that you asked us to set up and it went nowhere? Do you remember all the meetings I took for this? Do you remember how we set up this and that died and that? There's a lot of work that went into representing you that we never got paid for because we're on you know, because because we are on this commission base. Yeah, that's so, that, that, that's that's yeah, it's not a good argument. That's, those, <laughs> it, the, those are the two arguments that are basically. Yeah, I'm not saying I agree with it. That's the agent. The agent's position is is we. You know, there's a lot of work that we do for you that you never see, and that we this offsets all that work. Now, the reality of the situation is what what happened is the the WGA said, okay, fine. As a guild, as as represented writers, as part of this guild, we are collectively firing our agents uh, who do not sign a code of conduct, which basically would would eliminate packaging fees and the structure that as as it currently exists. And so, writers who had who are dear friends with their agents for many years uh, suddenly were without without agents. And um, a lot of the agents who, you know, were, again, were, were at these massive agencies, suddenly had all of their client lists leave them or most of their client lists leave them. And they're still trying to figure out how to bring money into their company so that they can justify their job. And so ultimately, and, and before COVID hit, there was talk of a, an all out writers strike that would just, again, collectively shut down the town. Now, Given that we're just coming, you know, you could argue that we're trying to see the light at the end of the tunnel for this COVID thing. Um, <laughs> you could argue that very be, heavily, sir. <laughs> yeah, it would be it would be shocking if the WGA said, "Great, productions are are uh, able to go again. Let's all strike." Yeah, that's you know. Oh, you guys haven't that, eaten. You haven't eaten in six months right. anyway. Let's right. strike. <laughs> Let's all strike. And so ultimately that that's sort of a, the 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 you know I guess the last 18 months to a year of of what has happened with the WGA and the ATA boiled down. So um, but wouldn't it make sense and let me just put this out there because I do agree now I'm I'm throwing in my two cents not that anyone's sure. going to give a shit but um that if the there is a value to what the agency is doing without their connecting of all of the pieces there is no it, it makes that project much more enticing and actually helps get it lit where i find the problem with it is that they are taking all the revenue and all the back end and not giving anything to the creator if there has to be a split there i do think that the right. agency if they're not going to take any money up front that they do deserve something on the back end and if everyone makes money we all make money uh, but there has to be a, a a cut there and that's where they got greedy i think if they would go okay guys um, we're going to take a, pro a packaging fee, but you guys are also going to get X to X, X, to X percentage of it too. Right. And we're going to share in the success as a whole, which is fair because without us putting right. this all together, chances are that we're not going to be able to make this happen. Um, right. so does that make sense? Am I out? Yeah, well, yeah, again, but, but you know, what's interesting again, we're, we're talking, you know, and I've got a lot of friends who are agents, a lot of good friends of mine, uh, you you can't blame an agent for being an agent even when they're agenting for themselves. Right? So, <laughs> I mean, you can't blame a scorpion for stinging the frog. Like it's exactly, that's what they that's are. Exactly right. <laughs> that's what they are. And they went and they went and got the best deal possible for themselves. And now you're trying, you know, now we're trying to back up that that cart. Um, no, but you're you're exactly right. And the other thing that that you know people aren't talking about is how agents don't really want to be agents in the traditional sense anymore because there's not a lot of money to be left to be made in it. You have, you know, look, you had, you had William Morris who was acquired by Endeavor, right? Which became William Morris Endeavor. And then it became Endeavor content. You know, there's Endeavor content, there's William Morris or WME. And 
ultimately, they're trying to figure out a way to diversify, to uh, uh, get other streams of revenue because they realize, again, to what we were talking about earlier, there there's only so many jobs in the traditional sense available in Hollywood, right? There's this many studio productions every year. There's this many TV shows that have this many writers in a writer's room. Eventually, there is going to be a ceiling for all that commission coming in. And so you can do you know, a couple of things. You can try and poach as many clients as you can and control as much of the town as you can. You can try and um, you can try and do the packaging fees and try to get money on the back end as well. You can try and finance content through a finance arm, which a lot of agencies are, are, are doing. Um, but again, agents are not able to be producers uh, legally, so they're not able to uh, participate in any uh, um, in any revenue or anything else except through this 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 packaging fee scheme, which was concocted. Whereas managers, which is what, again, which by a lot you know a lot of agents are like, well, fuck this, I'm gonna I'm not gonna be an agent anymore. I'm gonna go set up my boutique management company right. with right. these five other guys who are also former agents who still have a client list or whose clients will come back to them when we're no longer agents. Um, and we'll go set up stuff and we'll go produce stuff and we'll go find the financing and all that with our existing relationships. And so th- there's going to there is going to be a, a cataclysmic shift in terms of which agencies survive and don't. And the large ones will will get larger. The small ones may shift and, and decide to be management companies or, or fade out. Um, but ultimately, it's all good news for writers because, I mean, truthfully, it is because now writers are going to have access to. Former agents who are now managers who need to build out a client roster, so they're and, and also start, produce and they're also producing things too. So now they can they can now actually green light projects because they're built right. their. The thing that I'm hearing is that basically they're learning that I don't want to be I don't want to be a, a guy working on the line anymore or right. a girl working on the line anymore working for the man. I want right. to I want to monetize my relationships and my influence in this town. To be able to generate more revenue with those relationships. And that's basically what they're trying to do, which is where manager has been all along. But now right. it's like – so now the management pool is getting a lot larger and right. and agencies are starting to – yeah, I, I agree. There is a limit. It's just the town has changed. And let's not even talk about how many non-union, non-represented you know, talent is out there that is producing right. – that's producing right. work for Hallmark or we're producing work for Lifetime yeah. or working for International. That's – it, it, there's a lot. It's just the game has changed yeah. well, so absolutely. much. Well, and that's one of the things that I've, I've, I always talk about with, you know, I'll talk to executives all day long. I'll talk to writers, you know, through Stage 32 and, you know, I'll have I'll have writers email me and say, hey, I'm from the UK or I'm from uh, Singapore. I'm from uh, uh, Finland, wherever it is. And, you know, how do I get representation? I'm like, this is the time, man, because one, the Internet has changed connectivity in a massive way. You can you can do what we do from anywhere at mm-hmm. this point. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing, too, and, and again, you know, you're able to connect directly with um, managers, executives, producers, actors, filmmakers. And you don't need to be in the same room anymore in the way we had to be 10, five years ago, five months um, ago. <laughs> five months ago. And, and, totally, and you're exactly right. And it's far more accepted now to do a Zoom meeting, even if you're in Burbank and I'm in Manhattan Beach or wherever. We're not, you know, I'm well, not going to hop on a flight to fly to Burbank from Manhattan Beach. I mean, know, I, was, like, I was about to say Manhattan Beach is, you might as well be in New York. I mean, it's just a right. complete, like, I'm, I'm yeah. not going to, dr- I've driven to the stage 32 offices back in the day yeah. and I was like, it was an hour and a half, hour 45 to yeah. get there. And I'm like, yeah. I just say, RB, you got to do right. this. You got to come to me, man. I can't. I can't do this. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and that, totally. And now we can do this stuff. It's totally acceptable to do it over Zoom or Skype or whatever it is, and pack in four of these meetings in the time that it takes to do. You know, do to more drive business. to one. You do know, more bu- you're you're able business. to do more business. business you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and and and, and again, the, the 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 success that I've seen writers have as a result of no matter where they are in the world of connecting. Um, through stage 32, directly with executives, whatever it is, um, is incredible. I mean, the, the, the option agreements that are happening, the representation that's happening, the production agreements that are happening, all with writers who are not based in LA, it's, it's, it blows that myth out of the water that you need to be in a room with somebody in LA to get a job or to sell your script. Um, it, without question, especially for writers, uh, for filmmakers, right. I always tell them like, if you can make it out mm-hmm. to LA, I mean, I'm a, I'm a transplant. I've been here 12 years. 
if you can make it out here, the learning curve out here is so much more rapid than it is right. in a smaller market. You just, I told people like in the first year I learned more than la- in the first five years I learned in Florida. Sure. I was in South Florida. So it, it, it is, it, it just being in the business, being around it, talking to people everywhere you go. This is all pre COVID. Like any, any right. Starbucks you walk into, there's f- final draft everywhere. It's a joke. Right. Like, oh, for sure. Oh, it, it's a cliche. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's, it's, all you, you see know. is Final Draft laptops everywhere, and I and I always love walking. I always I always play this game. Like I'll jump into an Uber in LA. I'm like, so how's the script going? And and right. like, I'm telling you, five out of ten times, it's like, how'd you know? I'm like, <laughs> how's this? How's the script going? And how was the audition? Um, and those are the right. two. Yeah. Those and those are the, are the those are the two things that that you hear. But you you learn so much more being here. But with that said, if you live in another country, if you you can absolutely sell a script uh, right. without being in town. Uh, for writers, is a lot different than being for filmmakers. Filmmakers, I think, if you can't do it, it's great. If you don't right. have, but you but you don't have to. Not again, like the olden days. Yes, a thousand percent. Yes, but I would say also as an independent, if you're a truly independent filmmaker, meaning you're off trying to to, to shoot your own project in whatever part of the world you're in, the 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 barrier to entry is so incredibly low now in ter- it's basically your skill set so cuz you can shoot on you know my iPhone camera which is 4K quality right um you can shoot on you know you can cut on your home computer you, there are so many ways of getting your work out there that again didn't exist before and and if you've got something to say that people actually want to listen to you're limited by yourself at that point yeah i mean we shot Eagle on the corner of Eagle and Desire with RB for three thousand bucks <laughs> over yeah. the course of four days, <laughs> running around go. running around Sundance with a little 1080p camera, and it yeah. looked it looked fine. It looked great. I mean, I saw so yeah. I, I projected it in the Chinese theater, and it I was shocked at how beautiful it looked. It was so, but also, but that's being said, I have twenty five years in the business. I have a lot of tools in my toolbox. I carried a lot of the weight on my own shoulders. It's right. like you said, it's limited to your own skill set and right. and your own relationships as well. Right. Totally. Absolutely. So um, we could keep talking forever, Jason. Um, <laughs> but, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests. Sure. What are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Three screenplays. Um, the one that I love, uh, John August, uh, adapted Big Fish. I think yeah. it's inc- I think it's incredible. Um, I think the the next one that I would say that I, I really enjoyed, um, just from a pure writing perspective. Um, is the apartment which is behind me? Yeah. If you can't, you know, for those of you that have the picture, um, that screenplay uh, went through somewhere around twenty-seven revisions uh, before it was put into production. It's, it's from nineteen sixty, and it still holds up to this day. It's incredibly written, um, and and a, and a time capsule for the sixties, by the way. Which is it's 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 not like watching something like Mad Men where you see them try to recreate it. That's actually it. So it's a very cool step back in time, but it's, it's, it's so, so beautifully written. Um, and then the third one that I absolutely loved from a, from a, um, a writing perspective and Eisner to, to, uh, go back to somebody we were talking about earlier said it was the most perfect screenplay he ever wrote, or I'm sorry, read was, uh, Rage of the Lost Ark yeah. by Lawrence Kasdan. Um, which again is, is my favorite film, but we're going back and reading the screenplay. And then what I would also recommend doing, if you haven't, if you haven't done this is go back and read the transcripts of the call. Oh, I have that. Queen, it, and the oh, yeah. have that. I have it. It's on the show. It's on the, I'll put it, I'll put it in the show notes. I actually, uh, they, I posted it as an article. It's amazing to listen to it's Spielberg, amazing. Lucas and Kasdan break yeah. down. Indiana Jones. Everything from the, did, from the way did, the um, ball rolls to everything. It's incredible. Did, did uh, was it Kazan only, or did Lucas also co-write that, or was it Kazan only in that screenplay? That's a good question. I think it was Kazan with like a story by for George. Yeah, yeah, Lucas. Yeah, Lucas I've definitely got the yeah. story by. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, because Kazan is such an amazing writer. I mean, incredible, incredible. And then and then his son came back, and his, his son's doing number four or whatever, trying to write number four for the franchise. For which um, one? For for, for, for Indy for for Raiders. You mean number five? Oh God, are we on five now? Yes, we're on number five now. Thank you. I, <laughs> I skip say, over. I purposely skip over four. Yeah, I only it's, go. It's, I, it's, I go to three. It shall go, not be I discussed. To, yeah, I just go to, stop. Yeah, yeah, to, it shall not be discussed. It's, it's kind of like the best tril- yeah, it's still the best trilogy that has four movies in it. I would say that like it's Rocky one through four. Then we just go straight to six. We don't talk right. about five. It's right. it's not it's not needed. <laughs> exactly. Right. 
Oh. Um, now, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Um, write every single day. Uh, meet people, network every single day. Um, have a clear vision for yourself and the stories you want to tell. Be specific as possible in your storytelling um, to you. Um, it, it's, it's often summarized. You know, People will say, write what you know. And that doesn't mean write your autobiography. Um, it, it means write something thematically that resonates with you. And so be, be truthful to yourself, be honest with yourself about what resonates with you. Don't try to write something that uh, you think is going to hit in the market. Don't try to chase the trends like I talked about earlier. Um, but network, write every day, get honest, accurate, um, constructive feedback from, from sources that you trust. Um, because those are the things that are going to make you ultimately better. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think the, the longest that, that took me the longest to learn was that I should trust my own instincts. And if somebody, if somebody says, I don't get it or I don't see it, that doesn't mean that you're wrong or it doesn't mean that I was wrong. Um, it just meant that they saw something differently than I saw. And so I had to learn that just because somebody said, I don't get it or I don't see it or whatever, it doesn't mean they're shitting on you or your idea. You can uh, trust in trust in what you have to say. Yeah, because uh, I think Indiana Jones was uh, rejected by a few studios. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, I think wildly around town. Yeah, <laughs> I think everybody. I think the only reason yeah. Paramount agreed to it is that that Lucas like um, said he'll pay for most of it or something like that. And yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. And he exactly. owns a lot of it. So if it, if it hits, it goes, but if yeah. it goes down, he goes down in flames. So he took a risk on that. Um, yeah. And three of your favorite films of all time. Three of my favorite films of all time. Well, I've already mentioned the apartment. I've already mentioned Raiders. So I won't, I won't go back to those. Mm -hmm. um, and now you've just made it really hard or I made it hard on myself. <laughs> uh, back to the future. I think oh, is again so, so well constructed. Uh, I, I I constantly teach that film in in the writers room, um, which we'll, which we want to talk about in a second. Yeah. Um, constantly constantly teach that film. Um, Braveheart I think is is incredible. So great. Um, just a film wildly historically inaccurate, but but, <laughs> but, but good <laughs> cinema, good cinema, good cinema. So uh, so so well. Just constructed. like Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that Titanic, that was a documentary. That was a true story. That was a, know, obviously it. Rose. I mean, well, she's still yeah, alive. Uh, <laughs> she's still alive somewhere, floating <laughs> floating out there behind the back of the boat. Um, and then a third one, I'm just going to, I'm going to shoot from the hip on this and say whatever comes to my mind. Um, you know, I really, I really loved, again, just from a, an overall, it's, it's so well constructed as a film is uh seven i think seven is and and of course you, yeah. you can talk about everything else you know he's done since then but seven i think he was just so so well well he was just in his in his groove well you're talking you're talking my language now because seven is in my top five along with fight club as well oh, yeah i mean that, fight, that could, by the way that it could, it could have been a it could have been a, a tie between between fight club and seven two arguably of Two of the best movies of the nineties. Um, Two of the best, and that that I think are were were largely underrated at the time. You know, oh I yeah, Fight Club was definitely underrated, and it's aged very well. Yeah. and Seven very was a well. Seven was a hit, but seven it was hit. it was a pop hit. They were like, oh, it's right. it's. But now people are going, no, wait a minute, this is. It, yeah, it was. Yeah, at the time it was you know it was Brad Pitt and Gwyneth Paltrow, and you know it was like it was. But now it's like it's it's aged so well. I mean, and and they also say that with Zodiac, like people understand that that. That is a masterpiece. I mean, you you go back yeah. to Zodiac and you're like, when the Zodiac came out, it was like, eh, right, right, absolutely. That the the scene in Zodiac where they're showing the passage of time and they're showing the you know camera moves as they're building towers in San Francisco, oh. just to show years passing. In, it's in, incredible, incredibly. Inventive. He's one of the best. He is. He's our. Um, it's him. Him and Nolan. I always go back and forth between Fincher and Nolan because of their. Um, they are if you combine them the both of them you've got kubrick um yeah. <laughs> a current day That's kubrick sure. because sure. you know and nolan i think even more so cuz he really loves kubrick but yeah. i still remember walking out of eyes wide shut in 99 and my friends asking me did you get what did you think of it i'm like i don't know i'll understand yeah. it in 10 years 
But uh, right. I, I don't, and I did. I, it took me about 10, 12 years to figure right. it out. I'm like, right. oh, I see what you're talking about now. <laughs> yeah, totally. That, that, was on, I, that was on the other day, and I came in about a third of the way through it and stopped what I was doing and, and watched the rest of it. Because yeah, I was just, it's, 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 cap, it's hypnotic. It's, it's cap- my, it's personally my favorite Kubrick film. And I know there's a lot of people like, what? I'm like, it is mm-hmm. our, my personal favorite. And it still has the best opening shot mm-hmm. out of, it's like one of the yeah. top, top three opening shots of all time with the title right. that comes open. It was just, he was working at a completely different level. And I think currently Fincher and Nolan are both working at that. They're just right. at a Tarantino. There's a well, handful yeah. of filmmakers that are working at that. Well, ultimate level well that's exactly right and again there you can you can point to their specific style you can point to their sensibility and it's and it's so uniquely them and again if you want to be successful in this business that's that's a you you have to find that for yourself it doesn't mean you have to um you know uh uh copy what they're doing but you've got to find that sense of a sensibility that is uniquely you and not try to write for the masses it's it's you know if you write for everybody you're gonna fail absolutely and and a lot of people think well tarantino just steals from everybody i'm like yeah but that's his thing like right. how he is able to funnel his massive encyclopedic knowledge of cinema and spit it out through his right. filter is what makes him what yeah, he is absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. you know i mean it's these it's these great homages and and by the way every every filmmaker will will you know do we that on steal. some they, they will absolutely has everybody has an influence for sure. Everybody has an influence. Everyone steals. It's not like yeah. every everyone steals shots. Everyone steals. Yeah. Like we're all still like whoever came up with the close up. We're all stealing the close up. We're all stealing that's, the wide shot. Yeah. We're all leading the two shot. Right. Some camera right. guy set up the first two shot. Yeah, we're, can we're you stealing. Imagine, the- yeah, can you imagine <laughs> the, the first time they did a close up and everybody's like, "Holy shit, that worked." That's we're doing like- that again. Yeah. And then when they cut it between a, a close and a wide shot or something right. like that, they're like, what is going on? Like, can you imagine right. those days? Yeah, yeah. Um, unbelievable. One thing I didn't, I, we didn't discuss real quick, and, I've, I, and then we're going to get to the writer's room in stage 32, the volume and what's mm. going on with The Mandalorian and what they did. I just wrote an entire article about how – and it's not just me. Every, a lot of people who understand the technology is it's – this is as, empor- as important as a moment in – the history of filmmaking as a T-Rex walking across the screen, a 3D mm-hmm. T-Rex. It's that important. It's that right. life altering. Like movies will never be the same again after this technology has been used the way they've used it in the Mandalorian. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, a- absolutely. A-, a-, a thousand percent. And that's, I mean, that's what's so interesting about, about filmmaking in general. I, what I, 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 it reminds me of the other story about um, James Cameron, who, when he was doing Avatar, had the first Avatar, he had to literally shut down production to go invent shit that he could use to make Avatar. <laughs> right. You know, he's like, I, he's like, oh, we we just we just went on pause for like a year and a half, two years to go invent something because we needed yeah. to invent it. That's that's incredible to me. And, and I and I always tell people, um, I've got I've told many Cameron stories here that I've had a guest on who've worked on, mm-hmm. and they're just amazing stories. Right. But there is probably no other human being on the planet. That can do what Cameron does and has the the car blanche that Cameron does. Like I don't think Nolan is walking in and getting five hundred million to go invent technology. Like that's just right. not his wheelbarrow. Right. Spielberg's not getting that. Scorsese's not getting that. Fincher's right. definitely not getting that. Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> definitely not getting that. Who knows what that guy would invent? <laughs> I mean, no. no way he's giving no way no, right. no one with a sane mind gives Fincher an open checkbook. <laughs> But Cameron was that guy, and and you know he walked into a studio and said, "I've got this idea. It's a new IP. It's about a bunch of blue people. It's going to cost about five hundred million dollars. It's going to take about four or five years to figure out the technology. Um, no major stars. We'll have some, you know, we'll have Sigourney right. in it, and and you know, and most of the the main stars they're they're going to be CG most of the time, so you're not even going to see them. Um, but I, I got to figure this all out. Can I get you know? Can can you cut me a check for two hundred million so I could just start building the technology? Like who gets that? Like there really is yeah. no other filmmaker that yeah. would get that. And honestly, right. in history, the guy, who, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Well, yeah, the guy who who actually he's the only guy who made the most money with any movie in the history of cinema. He can walk in there and be like, okay, yeah, I, but I, even I can the, do this. but even then, is he has a track record of right. 
just being groundbreaking a technology right. every step of the way, every time right. he makes a movie. So it was well, just, that, I mean, yeah. Well, it reminds me, you know, guys like Howard Hughes, you know, these guys who were like filmmakers, but they were also like, he was an aviator. He was an inventor. He, that's those sorts of guys are, I mean, yeah, they're, they're once in a, a couple generations where they exist, you know, um, uh, Elon Musk. I mean, one of these guys who is just like a, billionaire inventor who's like let's throw this against the wall and see what it's iron works, man you know? it's iron man he's tony Stark. Yeah, it's iron yeah he's, that's exactly right i mean i'd be so curious to see what elon musk would come up with in terms of a um, of a movie if he was a director of something i'd be like i'd be i'd, I'd show up for that well I'm i mean <laughs> but tom cruise is going to be the first movie shot in space well, that's and, right and elon is helping so right so technically again, yeah and again if you're going to get an actor to do it who's probably one of the few actors in the world that they're going to go, yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. Will Smith's not getting that call. Brad Pitt's not getting that call. No. But no. Tom Cruise has set himself up to a place where like, nah, Tom Cruise wants to go shoot yeah. something in space. Let's yeah. go let him shoot something in space. Tom Cruise is the kind of guy that actually would 100% do that, where he's like, he yeah, I'll go to, to space. You know, I'll, you know, he swings from the Burj Khalifa. Yeah, I'll go to space. What the hell? That seems like the next logical progression. And, and they, I can't wait to see Top Gun. I had my buddy, a buddy of mine worked oh. on it on VFX, and he was like, dude, the images are just – they shot all that for like real. Right. Yeah, it's, pra- it's all practical. It's all practical. It's, you it's, had to. You had to. You can't – you couldn't do right. – in today's world, you, you need something. Right. And he's actually you, you would, flying. You would feel, yeah, you would feel that. You would, if you were to do that all CG, you would, you would feel it. There's an inauthentic, inauthenticity to it. Sure. Yeah, it's amazing. But again, man, dude, we could talk for another two hours. I know. <laughs> but thank, so tell me about. Well, uh, so I'm tell close, me. I'm closing. Yeah, I'm closing in on Arby's record of eleven. I'm. I got one. I got one. <laughs> so, um, tell me uh, about what you do at Stage Thirty Two and the Writers Room, and tell me what you uh, and where can yeah. people find you. So, um, I'm the director of script services uh, over at Stage Thirty Two. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Stage Thirty Two, it started. Um, as an online networking platform specifically for the industry, you know, for specific for creatives, you know, filmmakers, writers, directors, producers, actors, actresses, craftsmen and women. Um, the idea being that, uh, you know, LinkedIn is for CFOs and it's corporate and it's cold and Facebook is photos of my grandma's cat and kids jumping on trampolines. And there was no place for creatives like my creative to connect. And so it was founded by the guy we're talking about, Rich R.B. Botto. Um, and then there's since been uh, two other divisions built out of that. There's the education side, which is run by the managing director, Amanda Tony, um, And we've programmed, without exaggeration, 1,200 hours or more of, of education from working executives, producers, screenwriters, um, uh, filmmakers, managers, agents, all with the idea that, again, no matter where you are, you can learn from these people um, who are doing it in the business. Um, and then my division is the script services division, which connects writers with managers, producers, executives, per, uh, uh, other filmmakers um, to get you know consultation calls, notes on a screenplay, uh, mock pitch sessions to help refine what you're doing in your craft because you can learn about it and then you're able to put it into practice through the script services division. Um, and we brought on a roster of executives from, I mean, without exaggeration, major studios, you know, universal MGM, sure. uh, Paramount television, the guys that are guys and, and, and women that are working in the business who can, who can help shorten that path to success. Um, and reaching out to me, it's just J merch at stage 32.com. Um, and I can help you know, again, guide, guide what, you know, your career based on what you're writing, the format you're writing, the genre, who makes sense for you to connect with. Um, because, you know, I want to, you know, I, again, I come from a manager, manager background. I come from a development background. I want writers to have success. Um, and then on the writer's room side, that's something that that's very, very cool because, you know, it's, it's a group of like-minded writers from all over the world who connect once a week, every Wednesday, and we have a different webcast that I host. And so, you know, one week we might be breaking down aspects of a screenplay, right? We might be breaking down romantic comedies. Um, the next week we're doing pitch sessions where members are able to pitch to an executive and get feedback on that pitch. You know, this is where it's working. This is where it can improve. Um, 
then we do an executive hour, which is actually a lot like this. I've got to have you on the executive hour. <laughs> Anytime. I'll, Anytime. I'll, I'll, pull you on our, I'll pull you on our webcast. You can come over to my place. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, 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 get to t- we get to talk about the business like this. And writers get to information and, and knowledge on what's working in the business right now, what they can be doing, to your point. Um, and then the last week, we, we turn the cameras, we turn the spotlight over the writers, and they get to share something they've written over the course of the month. And they'll get feedback from those other writers. And there's, you know, it's, again, we've got writers from as far away as Scotland and the UK, Italy, um, as close as right here in LA. Um, it's, it's an, it's a place where writers can be supported, connect with other writers, connect with executives, um, connect with me directly. Um, and it's, it's, it's just become such a familial atmosphere. You know, we've got over, I think we have over 500 members now, um, but it still feels like it, it feels like it's an intimate group, which is very cool. Um, and again, if you in fact, actually, here's what I'll do. If you if if your listeners or whomever it is, it doesn't matter if it's tomorrow or whenever this goes up or, or six months from now. Again, write me an email, j.merch at stage 32.com, and uh, I'll give you a, a free month to, to give it a shot. Um, nice, nice. Because it, so, it is so cool. And I, I like to give away free shit. So, um, yeah, so so I'll give your listeners a free month to come check it out. And, um, yeah, I, I, again, I want to have you on there because it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. We, again, we would, do, we would do another hour and a half at least, you know. And with this, I mean, as, as you know, I can talk. So uh, yeah. I'll be more than happy uh, to show up. Um, man, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing the information with the tribe and dropping – the knowledge bombs, as I, as I call them. So thank Anytime. you again, Jason. Stay safe out there if you can, please. Take care of it. Anytime. Absolutely. I want to thank Jason for coming on the show and dropping those amazing knowledge bombs on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe today. Thank you, Jason. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, please head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 074. And I want to thank you guys so much for all the support for the new website as well as uh, the podcast over the last year or so. It is because you guys have been downloading these episodes so much and sharing uh, links and articles to the website to all your friends and social media following that I, uh, I wanted to continue to add even more content and be more of service to the Bulletproof screenwriting community. So again, thank you so, so much for all the support. Also, if you guys have not already done so, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com and leave a review if you like the show. It really helps out the podcast a lot. Thank you guys so much again for listening. Please safe out there. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 